In 1992, the Tour de France intended to play its part in the bringing together of Europe as one economic community. Seven nations included on the route itinerary, taking in almost 4,000 kilometers. That's approximately two and a half thousand miles. A start beginning for the first time ever in San Sebastian on the northern coast of Spain. The opening prologue of eight kilometers, bringing together 216 riders from 20 nations and in 24 teams. Steve Bauer of the Motorola team, twice a leader of the Tour de France and once finishing fourth overall. He was trying now again for the big time. Others coming for the first time to the Tour de France included Alex Zula of Switzerland and riding for a Spanish team. While it was Andy Hampston, once fourth in the Tour de France back in 1986, the leader of the Motorola squad. And there were others too, like Greg LeMond, anxious to prove to the world they were still great. The three-time winner, back in the prologue time trial, anxious to wipe away memories of a year ago. And among the men that they all wanted to beat was Miguel Ingerain of Spain, the winner of the Tour de France one year back, and now riding within 100 kilometers of his hometown and anxious to prove to the Spanish he was still as good as ever. In the prologue time trial, he was. He beat the best time set by Alex Zula quite convincingly to become the first leader of this year's tour. So after that marvellous prologue time trial, the Spaniard Miguel Indurain is in the lead. Hello everybody, I'm Phil Liggett and welcome to our FCV video of the 1992 Tour de France. Well, as you watch this video, you will of course know the result and you'll know exactly what sort of race this has been. It's found a great leader to start with, now let's enjoy the action together. And the opening stage, staying in Spain and racing around San Sebastian, in the Basque countryside, 194 kilometers, that's about 122 miles, and as you can see, the weather is terrible. One ambition of the day, and that was by the rider in the green jersey, Alex Zula of Switzerland, because Zula now, a few seconds time bonus, would replace that second place overall in the prologue with the leader's yellow jersey, and on his 24th birthday. He got the early bonus, now all he had to do was hang on to the leading breakaway, being driven on here with the yellow jersey of Miguel Indurain, very prominent. On the climb of the Jais Gabel, the same mountain used every year in the San Sebastian Classic, the attacks were thick and fast, and Armand de las Cuevas, a teammate of Miguel Indurain on the Bonesto squad, was up at the front. The glacial descent, and this is Massimiliano Lelli, just about staying on the road there, and only just as he was in the leading group, which included Stephen Roach. They were all caught, and on the descent down into San Sebastian, an escape, a very late one at that, by Dominique Arnoux a top cyclo cross rider and this was the day to use his expertise in that discipline as he won the first stage into San Sebastian with the sprinters led home by Johan Museo right on his wheel. But the real winner of the day was certainly the Swiss Alex Zula. His early time bonus had given him the leader's yellow jersey on his 24th birthday. So on to the second stage, 255 kilometers and it brings the race away from the wet and dreary coastline of San Sebastian heading now into France. And immediately, this is an attack by Richard Berenc, another rider in his first Tour de France, second year professional, well, third season actually now. And he's actually now trying to break clear the field. He's starting to build up quite a lead here. The object is the yellow jersey, but he's riding very, very well on the hills, and he's challenging for the lead too in the King of the Mountains. Franco Coccioli wears the polka dot jersey of leader in the King of the Mountains today, and nobody Anxious now to the first rendezvous with the big climb in the Pyrenees, the Col de la Moye Blanc. It has to be said, this is a very flat opening to the Tour de France, but these stages, they're fast, there's been plenty of pressure on. This is again an attack by Veronk. He's been joined here by a teammate who's gone across the gap, Dante Rezzi, just off our camera there. And Michaud, the team manager, coming up and passing on the good news because this lead is growing. Javier Mergialdi is the rider here, spinning it out with Veronk, who takes the preem. And he scored so well today, Veronk. We've still got the big climb to come, the Col de la Marie Blanc. And by the time, if you can stay clear, so at the moment, the lead is up to 15 minutes over the field. So that's how much the big heads of state are thinking of this breakaway today. Here we are, Robert Miller in this chase group. And Moreno Argentin, the prince of the Spring Classics last year, but he's having a pretty rough start to the season. He's back after injury now in the Tour de France. Needs a good ride. Back up with the leaders here, Mergrialdi. A little Spanish rider here, riding extremely strongly at the moment and looking good in the sandwich of the RMO team from France. They've had a very up and down start. They lost Marcel Worst yesterday, the only retirement so far in the Tour de France with a nasty crash. He hurt his collarbone. Retsch has been dropped by the leaders. There are only two away now. And look at this chase group coming up. Claudio Chiapucci, Miguel Indurain. 
the world champion Gianni Bugno, and it was Charlie Motte tucked in the back. And this is a group trying to get back on terms. Laurent Fignon is in that group, so too Andy Hampston. And just look now how the Col de la Marie Blanc, well, they say it's not a tough climb here in the Pyrenees, but that was Eddie Broikink. The polka dot jersey on the far side of Coccioli, tasting his first Tour de France, and now into his early 30s. And Pedro Delgado also not enjoying the tough slopes of the Marie Blanc. Well, this field has completely split up because of the high speed so far this year's Tour de France. Greg Lamont also struggling. Sean Kelly on his back wheel. And the yellow jersey of Alex Zula a long, long way down the mountain. Let's go back up to the top. This is Richard Veronk, just about 15 seconds ahead there of Mergialdi, but the two of them still clear. The chase group and Charlie Motte took nicely on the back. What a powerful group this is. Injurain, Kier Pucci. Further down the slopes, this is Stephen Roach and uh, Andy Hampston, Fignon. They have a lot of time to make up on the descent. Thankfully, the roads have dried out after the early morning rain. And the toiling up here, up the climb of the Marie Blanc, but Alex Zula now is in all sorts of trouble. The one-day leader of the Tour de France, that's the way it's looking right now, as we go off into the rain again and the slippery way down. Well, at one stage, those two riders have built a 90-minute lead. It's coming down quickly now. It's down to around about seven minutes. Motte here, the teammate of Veronk, up in the lead, calling for his team car to get some idea of what's going on. But now it's the chase down and a general regrouping here. Something like 30, 40 riders getting back on terms, and Greg Lamond is one of them. Into the finish of Poe, the chase group on the pictures. Above the riders, they come in, but it's Javier Mergualdi who's gone clear, but the man signalling at the back is Richard Varenk. He knows now he is the new leader of the Tour de France, and that is important, especially when you're a Frenchman, bringing the race into Po, into France for the first time, and look at this. This is Richard Varenk, and the tears say it all. The proudest moment of his young life, he says, I've got the Mayo Jean, in the yellow jersey, and there's proof of that. Richard Varenk, the new leader of the Tour de France. And so to stage three, 218 kilometres, taking the riders due north away from Pau to Bordeaux, and a little bit of nepotism creeping in. Jean-Marie Leblanc, the director of the Tour de France, giving me the Medal of Recognition after 20 years hard labour. Well, I don't really mean that, of course. I've made a lot of friends and seen a lot of great riders over those 20 years. The Tour de France going on today, though, and the long ride now up to Bordeaux, and the weather at last a little bit more like we expect in the Tour de France. The battle for the time bonus is continuing. At Mont de Marsan, it's the Belgian champion here on the right in the black jersey, Johan Museo, taking on the demon sprinter from Tashkent, Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov, and Abdu Japarov narrowly given the verdict there and the six second time bonus. The breakaway now establishing some 100 kilometers into the long day. And this breakaway containing three riders from the Buckler team. This one here is Gerrit de Vries, who's on the attack. Noel Sagers is also in this breakaway. Girotto there to the right of our picture, the balding Italian on the Carrera team of Claudio Chiapucci. A little rider just going through our picture there, Sammy Morels, Rob Harmeling. And this breakaway having now forced... This is the rider with the most to gain here, Pascal Lino. He started the day five minutes, six seconds behind his teammate, Richard Veronk. He's come along as the policeman, but he's well aware now because this breakaway has gained almost 14 minutes that he is the leader on the road. And if this group stays away, he'll be the leader at the finish as well. The rider he's sitting on the back wheel of there, number 133, is Gerrit de Vries. And not surprisingly, the main field now being led by Bernesto. And now on the run into Bordeaux, and Piper has attacked, but they've caught him. He's gone to the kilometre to go, but they're right on him. That's Rob Harmeling, come past like a big train. Harmeling now hugging the barriers here in the sprint to Bordeaux. A year ago, Rob Harmeling was last in his first Tour de France. Now it looks like he's heading for the stage, when he hasn't really made a sprint here. He's more holding the top speed. That's Sammy Morels trying to get on terms, 100 metres out. Morels isn't going to catch him as he bobs and weaves. Rob Harmeling is holding them all off. He wins the stage. Sammy Morels in his second place, but the yellow jersey tonight, worn by Richard Veronk. Alan Piper, the man of the day. You're attacking a lot more this year. Is that because you're coming to the end of your career and you want to get the most out of it in these last few years? Exactly, yeah. I said to my roommate this morning, Jim Van der Lauer, he's only 23 years old, I said, you have to start enjoying it and, and, and really live for every day and make, make it fun because it's, it's such a fantastic life, you know. I spent seven or eight years 
riding and, and training and living 100% for the job and never really enjoying it, you know. That attack with one kilometre to go was a classic move. Did you think you were going to get it? It looked for a while as if you'd got it there. Well, I just looked between my legs and I didn't see anybody there. I saw the Coca-Cola sign at the finish. I thought, I just couldn't believe it. It's like, I've been dreaming about this for three weeks. I told this guy the other day I'm going to win in Bordeaux with, my, with one arm in the air like Miguel did in San Sebastian last year. But, uh, it just didn't work. <laughs> Alan Piper there, riding out his final season as a professional. The race going on, the fourth stage now, the team time trial, which is the race that many of the riders don't like to ride, and this, the Motorola team, is setting off from the town of Le Bourne. The finish also here in Le Bourne, but not too far away, a couple of kilometres away from the finish line and the start line together. And you know, this is the sort of race that the riders don't like to ride because, although it's a team race, they're racing for the individual overall standings of the Tour. Steve Bauer here, riding very strongly in these opening days, bringing home the Motorola team. They've been up amongst the leaderboard at all of the time checks, top six positions for them at every one of the time checks, and sixth position was their final place as they came up to the finishing line, led up here by Ron Kiefer. Their time for the ride is one hour, 14 minutes and three seconds. The time taken, as with all of the teams, on the fifth rider to cross the line. The Gatorade Team 2, nursing tour favourite as far as they were concerned, Gianni Bugno, riding in the white jersey of the world champion. And Bugno too has made somewhat of a shaky start to this race. Don Fignon trying to work hard as he tucks in nicely behind the rider in the white jersey. Bugno as they come up towards the line, but their time too, 1.13.36. Always in the top three over the last part of the course. The overall lead. This morning on the shoulders of Pascal Lino. His lead now over his teammate Richard Baronk, 1 minute 54 seconds and 6 minutes 28 seconds of Miguel Ingerain in the Bonesto team here as the Bonesto riders sprint home. They too not among the leaderboard all of the way and for them a final position of 7th, 50 seconds off the eventual winning time. Back at the start line in Le Bourne. Many of the riders, by the way, haven't taken time out to ride this course as they went down through Bordeaux, heading towards the start by car at San Sebastian. So they knew what they had to face. Greg Lamond and the Z team. And Lamond in his familiar time trial position, which a couple of years ago in 1989 confirmed him as the tour's fastest ever time trialist then, as he took on Laurent Fignon one on one to win the Tour de France by just eight seconds. Atla Volsvol bringing the team home here, and a word of congratulations to him from Gilbert Duclos Lazal. Greg Lamont happy with that one. So the Z team, they finished in fourth place. They were 40 seconds off the race winners who were coming home now, the Panasonic team. This team, under the command of Peter Post, won their first team time trial back in 1976. And out of 26 events, they've won the team time trial no fewer than 12 times. They were back on top of the form, the best time of the day, one hour, 13 minutes and 15 seconds for Panasonic. The RMO team, well, they weren't expected to ride too well as Carrera were heading up towards the finish. The RMO team finished the race in 13th place, but they hung on to the overall lead with Pascal Lino, 1 minute 54 seconds ahead of Richard Beronk. The Carrera team, leading on the early part, came home with the second best time of the day, and this was good news for Claudio Chiapucci because he was gaining time over Miguel Ingerain, who was still the outstanding favourite for the race. Second place for the team, Keir Pucci up to fourth, Roach up to fifth. A year ago, Stephen Roach had been disqualified for missing the start of the team time trial. What a difference a year makes. The team's riding extremely well, but you've been riding well all year as well. Yeah, I've been riding very consistent all year, and since the road to Tour of Spain, I've been getting better and better. But, um, you know, I have this little problem in my back. It's, getting, it's not getting any better, but it's, I'm kind of looking at myself every day. But um, it's a little handicap, but I'm very, very happy with the condition I have. You must be looking forward to, towards getting to the mountains. You know, you've not got too much pressure this year. You've got other riders in the team who are taking the pressure, like Kia Pucci, you've got Abdi Zaparov on the flat stages. Do you think we might see a Stephen Roach like we saw a few years ago in 1987? Well, Stephen Roach is still the same with a few grey hairs more extra. But um, the condition is better now than it has been since 87, so anything can happen. I think the, the, the level between myself and Duran is not that great. That if, I, if I can get lucky someday, maybe I can get a lucky break, maybe. 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 The condition's good, but how's the morale? Do you feel like racing now? I never felt like doing anything else. And even in the last few years when things weren't going too well for me, that's how I kept, was able to keep going back every time. After every time I got knocked off the top, I was with a knee problem, with a back problem, I kept coming back. So 
I think their morale has never been a problem. Definitely not now. If Pierre Pucci has a problem in the mountains, are you good enough to take over or will you just stay there to help him? <laughs> I'm good enough to be there when he, when he has got a bad day, I'll be happy enough. <laughs> Stephen Roach remembering the great days of 1987 when he won the two big tours and the world title. On we go, fifth stage, 196 kilometres now. The riders heading up towards the Belgian borders and the flag, the start flag, being carried by Michel Dernis on the Motorola team this year and himself a Belgian heading towards his home. Stephen Roach, time out at the back of the field on these early moments to read the paper. And that the man from Ireland really has found his old morale. The sadness of the days gone by in northern France with the gravestones of all of the cemeteries that abound in this area. And the two well wars, a touch of wheels there, and that was Alonso who went down. And I think, you know, he clipped his head on the roadside there. Well, as you may well know, crash helmets are not compulsory in professional cycling in Europe. It's a matter of personal choice, and Alonso here might have required one there because he has hurt his head. And this is another crash, too, that we're watching here in slow motion. And one of the riders delayed there is Miguel Indurain, number one. And a little friendly push off there by his teammate, Jean Francois Bernard, the Frenchman on the Spanish Bonesto squad, along with Fabrice Filippo, both riders in the tour. As the race goes on now, heading towards Vascal on the borders of France. And this breakaway, which is some eight riders, has established itself. It's gone clear at around about 176 kilometres covered today. And Bauer is one of the riders in this front group, Jim van der Laar, Kengi Alta from the Ariostia team, attacked by Steve Bauer. Bauer has tried all day to break away from this group. It's partly because of his riding. The group has established in the first place. And look at this now. Bauer going for gold here. He's 13th overall this morning, 6 minutes 12 seconds back. Off the race lead, still on the shoulders of Pascal Lino who leads by a minute 54, but Bauer has a real chance now to move up. This breakaway has been building time. The race itself, because of the speed, is running some 50 minutes ahead of schedule. And the breakaway going clear. Bauer chasing a six-second time bonus, which he has won, and that's going to help him move up ever so slightly in the overall classification. As the race now turns towards the finishing, this group has come all back together again. There's been a constant stream of attacks from Bauer, but he's been recaptured. He's in this group again, and that looks like Guido Bontempi is going clear. Now, this is a classic move by the Italian. The Italian rider, 32 years of age now, but he won on his big day in 1986, three stages of the Tour de France. He's won in Limoges since then, but he's now coming back to form with a lone win here. He's clear of the field. And four hours, five minutes, and counting the time for the day, Guido Bontempi of Italy, a clear win on the stage, but it won't give him the overall lead. Bauer is the man who's profited. He's moved up to third overall. This is the result of the stage. Bontempi ahead of Dmitry Konishev of the former Soviet Union, 30 seconds back. The overall, though, there is that confirmed. Bauer is now third in this race, ahead of Hepner, Bugno and Chiapucci. And so the race moves on, stage six, 167 kilometres, and now we're heading off into Brussels and across the borders into Belgium. The third country that the race will have visited since its start in San Sebastian. Michel Denis of Motorola on the right of our picture there. Former winner of the Kellogg's Tour of Britain. Smiling because, as he would say, it's typically Belgian weather. It's wet and it's not very nice at all. The border and the police in Belgium cheering the race across to their side of the country. And as you can see, no border check here. But you know, there's no stop for stopping this rider. This is Claudio Chiapucci. He's determined to attack, he says, all the way to the finish of this Tour de France in Paris, and he's pushing the pace again on the climb of the Le Clou. There's no real big climbs on this race. They're all fourth and third categories today. And there's six of them coming. But they're short and they're sharp because over the back end of the course, the riders are facing up to the Tour de Flanders race route before they break off and head into Brussels. And this is the group at the back here, Thierry Marie of France. And number 21 is Claudio Chiapucci, 92 is Johan Capio, former champion of Belgium, classic winner. And 51 is Greg Le Mans. Well, this is a strange alliance. They've gone clear at about 22 kilometres today on the climb of the Lenclou and they're facing 140 kilometres in the lead if they stay away to the end. A time check coming up there for Greg LeMond. And the alliance of the two, the American and the Italian, well, that's a turnabout because in the 1990 Tour de France, it was the great battle, and LeMond had to chase Chiapucci down the Tourmalet to take back the leader's yellow jersey and go on to win that Tour de France. 
But it's the Gatorade team as Gianni Bugno and Laurent Fignon who are mustering up the chase. Benestos are helping out a little bit. There's Thierry Marie, three times winner of the prologue. Remember that great breakaway a year ago, over 240 kilometers in the lead before he won the stage, which gave him back very briefly the leader's yellow jersey. And now he's in the move again. It's good to see the stars on the attack, though, because the weather conditions are bad. There is a chance of a good time gain here. They're sprinting out the small time bonuses. And Claudio Chiapucci takes the six seconds ahead of Laurent Jalaber. There's a little surprise. Chiapucci really can turn out the sprints when he wants to, and he's going to keep it going. Jalaber has sat up, but he's going to have to take him on and catch him up here because the conditions now are atrocious. And there's cobblestones on today's route, too, as we approach the finish area around Brussels. This four-man breakaway is building time. It's had a lead of over two minutes. And it must be very, very dismal in the peloton. And this is at the back of the peloton. These are the cobblestones I was telling you about. There's been a mass pile up here. And there's at least 20 riders on the ground. I think that was Rob Harmeling, the winner at Bordeaux, who we've just seen lying on the roadside there. And this rider is Gerrit de Vries, who was on the road. And also Eros Poli here from the Italian GB team. That is Rob Harmeling, and he doesn't look too well at all. The winner in Bordeaux is stunned here by this fall and his left leg is looking very, very painful indeed. Let's go back up to the leaders because they're still in the rain, but they're now in the shadow of the Atomium that was built for the 1958 exposition here in the centre of Brussels, and that will depict the finishing line today, and the four are still clear, gaining time over all of the stars in the Tour de France today, and two of them are right here. Jalaber is going for the sprint, the sprinter from the Anse team, but he's French, and the French into Brussels get the stage win. And in second place there is Claudio Chiapucci. Third place, Brian Holm. And the fourth man over the line, Greg LeMond. Well, as ever, Greg LeMond is climbing up to fifth overall now. And the press annoying him at the finish. As always, the hottest property in world cycling, even if he didn't win the Tour de France last year. And the only way of escape is over the barriers and into the safety of underneath this truck. He's asking for a little bit of time to get changed. I want to change. I want to get naked. Sorry. Please. Greg, you started this Tour de France off in a very tired state, but you seem to be getting better as the days go by. Yeah, I feel better. Uh, I felt better since uh, the team time trial. So these, sta these stages seem very open, and the teams like Bonesto and Gatorade don't seem to be able to control the racing. Well, when uh, I knew it was an opportune time to go because uh, the break before with uh, you know Hampton, Rooks, and all that, uh, everybody chased hard, and I knew everybody was tired, and it was started raining, and Kiyopuchi went for the uh, hill prime. I just followed and. I knew that was going to be uh, <coughs> a decisive moment. Everybody was very tired. You must be feeling a lot more confident than you were the few days ago when I spoke to you in San Sebastian. <laughs> well, it's not the mountains. <laughs> well, we you... wait and see how I feel in the time trial. Today is just an opportunity time, and <coughs> I knew on one of these days I could do that. Uh, I, was, I was hoping for it was a day like today. So Every opportunity <laughs> is a good one, though, in the Tour de France. Well, especially when you start bad. <laughs> Either way, it must have been a great morale booster there for Greg. The overall lead, Pascal Lino, still leading this race. Steve Bauer profited on the day too, and he climbed up into second place. This was the stage result. Jalaber beating Kiapucci, Holm and Le Mans. Overall, though, 3 minutes 11 seconds, the gap back to Bauer and Kiapucci in third place. Alan Piper, now with Paul Sherman, is the best man to assess the race so far. Well, and we've had the first week of the Tour de France. We've got it under our belts now. What's the story on the street about, uh, about the riders at the top? Well, there's been a lot of action happening in the bunch anyway. The last few days has been just incredible pace. 46 and a half yesterday, average in the rain, and 48 the day before. I've never ridden so hard in my whole life. You've got Chiapucci and Le Mans, they just seem to be driving, driving, driving. I think Greg's trying to get some time before the mountains. And yesterday, Indurain had me a little bit worried. He's my favourite. I want that man to win, you know. But I get the feeling he's a bit nervous. And I think it's because of Bunyo. Bunyo's like... He's the cool, calm and collected man at the moment. I, I just sense that Indurain's not quite as cool as he used to be, or he was in the Giro, you know, there's more competition. Chiapucci and Greg, well, they're out there racing. They're racing on the flat stages. We've still got to have the time trials in the mountains. They're probably trying to make up as much time as they can. It's, uh, it's difficult to say what else is going to happen, but I think Bunyo and Indurain are going to fight it out. 
I'm hoping it's going to be Miguel, but I'm getting worried about Bruno anyway. Uh, Chupich is looking really cool. He kept, keeps coming and showing him his pulse meter, how low his pulse is. The other day he came along beside me and uh, his pulse was 95. And I said to Phil Anderson, how fast are we going, Phil? And he said, 60. <laughs> I nearly fell off my bike, you know, I know my pulse pretty well and I think it was about 160. <laughs> any difference that guy, any wonder that guy's better than me, isn't it? <laughs> well, I don't know, Alan, winner there of the Tour of Sweden a few years ago and a stage in the Tour of Italy, retiring this season. 188 starter this morning, first attack of the day, Mario Cipollini, who is the Italian playboy, and although the weather doesn't demand it, the shades there make him look quite a spectacular sight, doesn't it? He's gained five minutes over a lethargic field. By the way, Bruno Cornier, Gerrit de Vies, Eros Poli, Falk Bowden, among the non-starters this morning, all victims of that big pile-up on the road into Brussels. And look at the faces here now as we head off into Holland, where there are reported to be massive crowds waiting for the Tour de France. Miguel Ingerain still riding nonchalantly. We've hardly seen him attack since that first day in San Sebastian, waiting for the time trial, which isn't long away now, as this race traverses all of the countries heading down uh, through to Luxembourg, where the time trial is. Faces here of the attackers of the day. Jörg Muller is up in this breakaway now. And again, riders streaking across the gap. This is Olaf Ludwig, the 1988 Olympic champion there. Jörg Muller looking over his shoulder to check to see if this breakaway is going anywhere. And look at these crowds. The police are estimating over a million spectators on the roadsides today taking this race into Valkenburg. And a nasty sting in the tail, too, for the riders. And if you want confirmation we're in Holland, well, there it is, even to the flags on the end of the windmill sails. Well, this race has broken up and regrouped all day, but this little breakaway now seems to be going clear. Stephen Roach is in it. And despite his back problems, he really is enjoying his Tour de France this year. Roach driving a group here which contains Valerio Tabaldi. Here he is from the Gatorade team. Remember that's Gianni Bugno's team. And the Helvetia rider just behind him is Gilles de Leon. He's searching for a little bit of form. He hasn't had too much luck this last season or two. There's De Leon. Finished fourth in the Wincanton Classic in 1991, but really didn't get a win at all. Former winner of the Tour of Lombardy and finished third in Milan San Remo. And the weather again is turning nasty. The Z team, Greg Lamont Z team, being ordered to take up the chase here. Roach is the man with a lot to gain in this breakaway. And he knows it too. As we head up towards the top of the Cowberg here, up towards the finish, this breakaway is still clear. And it's clear by just on the minute from the main chase group. And the field behind has generally regrouped. Tabaldi sitting tight onto Roach's wheel. Because once you're over the top of this climb, the Coburg, it's coming away from the town of Valkenburg. The finish is a couple of kilometres outside. We're in South Limburg here, right down on the German borders. And this is the holiday area for the Dutch. They call it Little Switzerland because of the hills. An attack now by Rolf German. Ariostia, this was to be expected. He's gone for the long one. He knows Roach could finish off with a good sprint finish. And Roach is a little bit slow there to get the back wheel of Gilles de Leon. De Leon safely on the wheel of Tabaldi. But you know, if they hesitate like this, then Jarman is going to win this race. He's gone clear, and Roach must be worried now. He's seeing the victory go away from him. De Leon isn't going to take up the chase. Neither is Tabaldi. They want Roach to do it, and Roach is going to. Roach goes on the right of the road. Now he rips away from the field. Tabaldi is slow on the uptake. De Leon equally so. Rolf Yerman coming up towards the line. He's been passed, though. Yerman's been passed by Roach, and De Leon is on. De Leon has got this race. Roach is beaten on the line. So Gilles De Leon, another Frenchman, but he rides for the Swiss Helvetia team, gets his stage victory, and that will boost the morale for him after four hours and 21 minutes in the saddle today. And Carrero Girotto has led in the field of 57, and this overall now means that Stephen Roach has climbed up to fourth place, four minutes, 11 seconds back. And what a backup for Kia Pucci, too. We're now heading to our fourth country in as many days, 265 kilometres on into Germany. Tim Mary seemingly very happy this morning, but the crashes are continuing, and this looks like it's Fabio Parra on the ground. Well, this is absolutely amazing history repeating itself here because Parra crashed out last year on the bridge to Tonqueville in the north of France, and it was a bridge which has caused the crash again, and right on the side of the road too. And I'm afraid that the way Parra is nursing himself, he's broken his ribs here, and that is very, very sad indeed. So the Colombian is out of the Tour de France, and very likely his final Tour de France 
But you know, back in the main field there, nobody seems to mind too much about the crash. This is Greg Lamond. He seems more concerned about what he ate last night. I didn't get one. Didn't make it. Uh, uh, didn't make it. Uh, <laughs> So Greg Lamont talking about one of his favorite foods, Chinese. The other, as we all know, is Mexican. This is Claudio Chiapuccido livening the race up yet again here. Just a few small hills today, only two fourth category climbs. They head out down the Moselle towards the beautiful town of Clubenz. It's on the confluence of the Rhine and the Moselle, and it is a great wine-growing area. But the weather, as you can see, again is atrocious. The attack's coming thick and fast once more. This race maintaining its highest ever average speed. Jesper Skibby is the rider in this breakaway. Number 166 here is Leonis Baruthia from Spain. And he slipped the field a little bit too. But still Pascal Lino is hanging on to that leader's yellow jersey. Bunyo flashing through our picture there because tomorrow is the big time trial. And so that's why they're not concerned by this breakaway. It's going to be successful now as Jan Navens, who's broken away from the leaders in the last kilometre of the stage. And the Belgian rider, now 34 years of age, gritting his teeth here. The main field is still over four minutes behind. And his breakaway companions are also in his slipstream now. He wins the first stage for Belgium of this year's Tour de France. It won't affect the overall standings at all. Jesper Skibby there coming over in second place. Giroto third, Leonid Baruthia in fourth place. Overall, well, there's no change at all except that Hepner is now up into second place. The race now transferring into Luxembourg by car for the first crucial time trial over 65 kilometres. So, Miguel Indurain, the champion of France, winner of both of the time trials one year ago, is now on his way in the city of Luxembourg. And from this moment on, for him in this year's tour, every second will count. 80 kilometres an hour, 50 miles an hour, and it's for this man, Paul, Claudio Chiapucci at the moment. Well, for a man who isn't very good at time trialling, he's going at a fine, fine speed here, over 50 kilometres an hour. This is one of the faster points on the circuit we get a good chance to see the choice of equipment by Kia Pucci today he's using a spoked wheel in the front that'll be three or a four spoke and he's using a solid disc wheel at the back but the man really is going fast he wants to fight his way back up he's got an advantage on the other leaders at the moment and wants to keep it here is Laurent Fignon a twice a winner of the Tour de France in 1983-1984 he won both of those tours by virtue of his brilliance in the time trial now out on the course, and Miguel Indurain is eating into the men ahead of him because this is Indurain Paul, and he's bridging a gap here to his two-minute rider. So that'll be Giancarlo Perini, I would think, the Carrera rider up the road in front of him. He really is riding. He's settled in so quickly today. This man really has become the man of the time trial this, year, this last year. Look at the time as we come up to the next check of 47 kilometres, 37 kilometres. He's going to go through in under 42 minutes. 41, 51 is going to be the time, and he's so much faster. He's going to be two minutes faster than Gerard Rue at that time check. That is amazing. Now he hits the cobble hill and dances away, and dancing away too to big gains in the Tour de France today. And this is Gianni Bunya now coming up to his check here at 20, at 40, at 37 kilometres. And the second time of Rue is already on the board because the time of Indurain, 41 minutes, 51 seconds, the best time, and it's well down on that. So Gianni Bunyo is losing major time here to Miguel Indurain. And Bunyo is complaining, he can't understand why Miguel Indurain is just gonna count on the mountains and the time trial to make up his difference. As you see, he's gone down there two minutes behind Miguel Indurain. I think he's learning out today why Indurain is waiting for the time trial. And so Greg Lamond are now coming through to his halfway time check. And remember that Abunio has gone through two minutes, eight seconds slower than Miguel Indurain. Lamond is faring a little better than that because he's going to go through with the second best time. Greg Lamond pounding the gears, turning into that right-hand bend now. He'll just scrape inside the time of Gerard Rue. So he is the closest challenger, it seems, uh, to Miguel Indurain on the road. As Le Mans goes through there, he's 142 down on Indurain at the moment, but this morning he was just one minute in front of the man, so Indurain is really taking the leaderboard by storm today. This is Stephen Roach coming through now to the halfway point. There have been some stupendous tyres done by riders here at this point, and Roach is still holding on in there. He's going through the third best time for Stephen, conceding a 1 minute 50 seconds as he starts at the cobble climb now, and the second part of the course to come.
This is Miguel Indurain coming up towards the line, and this could be a, a tremendous ride because he is caught and passed. Laurent Fignon, I wonder when that last happened in the Tour de France, if it ever did indeed. Look at this time by Miguel Indurain, the best man on the clock. He started very early this morning, Indurain's teammate, until Las Cuevas, but this time he's going to annihilate that time. Miguel Indurain laying the foundations, I think, today for victory in the Tour de France because he has come with a tremendous time. Fignon will not let him go. One hour, 19 to 31 for Miguel Indurain. And he caught Laurent Fignon as well. And look at this, mobbed by the crowd at 49 kilometers an hour. And here's the arrival of Gianni Bugno, second last year in the Tour de France. And his time a long way off that done by Miguel Indurain of one hour, 19.31. Look at this, in just 65 kilometers, Indurain has taken all of this time out of Gianni Bugno. And the world champion coming up to the line, Zenon Yaskula in third place with the time nearest to Bugno as he comes. But Bugno may even fall out and into fourth place here. That's what the time checks are indicating as Bugno comes over the line now. One hour, 23, 12 seconds only. Third best time concedes three minutes and 41 seconds to Indurain. The arrival of Greg Lamont now as he comes down to the finish. Bugno is in. He's conceded three minutes 41 seconds to Miguel Indurain. And Greg Lamont, I think, is going, it's fair to say, will be in the same bracket today because he started off very quickly indeed, only conceding 47 seconds at the early checks, holding into the second check. But it seems that Greg, too, has had a hard ride over the second part of this course. Gianni Bugno's time is on the screen now. The computer picking that out, passing on to Zenon Yaskula. So Le Mans has gone slower than Bugno. A final burst for the line. As he comes to the line, Greg really has cracked over the last few kilometers of this race, but he's still keeping himself in contention for the second or third place at the moment. Le Mans really riding well. He's a kind of rider over the next few days. I think we'll see going into the attack again because he knows the strength of Indurain. 123.35, fifth place for Greg, but four minutes away from the time of Indurain. Miguel Indurain with the fastest time trial ever seen in the history of the Tour de France. A massive gain over Bugno of over three minutes. Indurain now up into second place. Lino survives. And with everybody still talking about that superb time trial from Miguel Indurain, they face now the 10th stage of 217 kilometers, the road back into France. Miguel Indurain not in the yellow jersey, not far off it either. And still, Claudio Chiapucci intends to give Indurain a very uncomfortable ride if he is indeed to win this year's Tour de France. Small win on one of the fourth category climbs today. There are four of them in all on the road back into Strasbourg. And the riders still putting the race under pressure. As they've tried to do every day, this race will simply not go slowly. Champion of France, Luc Leblanc, trying a little move there. Gianni Bugno also now searching after that massive beating he took yesterday, losing 3 minutes and 41 seconds to Miguel Indurain. Stephen Roach was another big loser. He lost over 4 minutes. And so now they were looking for a chance here to try and get some of this gap. Back at least. Edwin van Hooydonk, the Buckler team. On the attack, Andy Bishop there from Motorola. And sitting at the back there, one of the PDM riders. Didn't quite catch who it was there, but this is Steve Bauer wanting a little assistance from his team car as he puts everybody under the attack. This little group moving away nicely at the moment on the flat roads now, but it's not to be as the field is regrouped here in the streets of Strasbourg. It's down to the sprinters again. And this is Vyatyshev Yekimov leading out the sprint here. Olaf Ludwig has got his wheel very, very nicely indeed. That's the man he's leading out. But watch the right there, Lon Jalaber going. Jalaber has the lead. Abdul Japarov in the middle and Van Poppel coming up on the outside. And Jean Paul Van Poppel gets it on the line. The sprints at last have their day. 167 riders fighting out that sprint, won by the Dutchman Jean Paul Van Poppel. But overall, no change. Yet Greg Lemon seems depressed at the speed of the race. When you start to head to the mountains, have you got any special tr strategy or is it just going to be a, a, a something that happens on the road? I think it's just going to be something that happens on the road. I'm, it's about one of the most difficult Tour de France I've had, uh, that I've ridden uh, before we've even hit the mountains. I think half the peloton, I know I'm very tired uh, without even going into the mountains and uh, it's going to be a matter of survival.
for a lot of riders tired already. How do you think Bunyo's uh, Indy Range team looks exceptional already? Yeah, they're, they surprised me. I don't know. I just can't explain it. They weren't riding well at all in the beginning, and everybody came on like rockets yesterday, and they're, they're riding well. It's going to be a hard job for him, but he's got the legs like Indoran. Nothing's too hard. Well, the Alps are getting closer, but they're still two days away. We're now heading off into the Vosges Hills here on the 11th stage of 249 kilometers. Miguel Indurain done his job well in the time trial. Now looking very contented and relaxed, riding alongside Stephen Roach there on the far side. And this is Rolf Goltz. Well, he won the Tour of the Mediterranean very early on this year with a huge lead by taking it all on the first stage. And now he's going for a long one today because the flag has only just been pulled in to announce the start of the day. And the first climb of the day, they called the Kreuzerweg. And the field is staying bunched together and Goltz's time is going up. A long, long climb here into the Vosges Mountains. Goltz now some nine minutes in the lead and the bunch don't seem too interested, do they? Well, I'm not surprised. Goltz, 108 this morning, a long way behind overall. Former stage winner in the Tour de France and over the top here of the Col de Troisweg. This is a beautiful area of France. And of course, it was in the mountains here where the Tour de France came many, many years ago in the early 1900s to tackle the first climbs. They're steep and they're very, very hard. And the villages, very, very pretty indeed. Alsatian villages here. So we head off now. At each turn of the pedal revs, the high mountains of the Alps are coming closer. Miguel Indurain in the blue jersey there knows this. And they're content to allow Galtz's head at the moment at least. Just finding out the battles for the King of the Mountains points. In all this year, there are 63 noted climbs in the Tour de France. They're joining its 4,000 kilometer journey to Paris. Four of them all category. They're the big ones and they're still to come in the Alps and six of them first category. But today, just one first category coming towards the end, the climb of the Grand Ballon, the big balloon. And Charlie Motte here, well, his team has had a tremendously successful tour so far, and Jerome Simon hanging back for somebody off the back of the group. And it looks as though Jerome Simon has decided to fall back from a little attack he's launched there and wait for the field coming up. And in fact, what has happened here, I think the message has come back that the field has split and Jerome Simon has been told to go back to this group because Greg Lamond is in it. And that's Greg Lamond here. And Lamond is in big trouble here in the Vosges hillside. He's in second place here, being nursed by his teammates. The other rider here with him is, in fact, Jean-Claude Colotti trying to set the pace alongside Greg Lamond. Uh, no, it's not Colotti, in fact, that is Francois Le Marchand, number 58, Jérôme Simon. Good strength here in Simon, a stage win the Tour a couple of years ago, when it was down in the Pyrenees. Well, this is the Col de la Schlucht, and the rider's going straight past Rolf Goltz there, and he can't do a thing about it. It was Fabio Roscioli and Dmitry Konishev. And just look at this now, because Goltz has been picked up here by Rondon, the Gatorade rider in the green, and Oscar Vargas of Amaya. They also have gone by him as they come up towards the top of the Col de la Schlucht. Two riders already over the top here, Roscioli and Konishev. And in the sprint for third place, well, it's not really a sprint, is it? Oscar Vargas takes third place and Rondon over in fourth. So Goltz, well, after a long breakaway, which gave him a massive lead at one stage, has all been wiped away now, the field splitting up behind. As the climbs go on, there's still the Col de Bramont and the Grand Ballon to come, and it's the Grand Ballon, which is the big one. These are the two leaders now setting out the pace. Dmitry Konishev at the back. He won two stages of the Tour de France last year, including the one at the end on the Champs-Élysées, which they all want to win. And here, as we go over the top now of the Col de Bramont, they're clear. Third category climb, and Carrera continuing their great tour. And there's a nice little touch from Konishev indicating to Roscioli, you can lead us down this mountain. You see the difference in the mountains here. The roads are very narrow in the Vosges, and this is Laurent Fignon now. Now, this little group has got away on the climb, and Laurent Fignon, four riders here at the moment. Vargas is still here, and Rondon is with Fignon, so the Gatorade boy have two riders in the lead, and I just try to catch a glimpse of that class rider who's come up with them there, but it looks to me as though it might be Gonzalez who's come up there, Arsenio Gonzalez it is. So this is an interesting little group now. Laurent Fignon on the attack, that's something we haven't seen for a long time. Winner of the Tour de France in 1983 and 1984, when he was the master of the individual time trial and still stinging 
from that six minutes capture by Miguel Indurain in the time trial at Luxembourg this year. But there's no doubt that Fignon has been inspired on this climb of the Gambolon because at the back of this little group now is Dmitry Konishev, so they've picked him up. And it's a very good ride being done here by the class Spaniard, Arsenio Gonzalez. But look at the rhythm being tapped out on the slopes here of the Grand Boulogne, and that's why Fignon has gone clear. Fignon now is free as a bird on the climb of the Grand Boulogne. Well, there's still some 50 kilometres to go once he's over the top of this big climb, but that banner surely is inspiration now to the Frenchman. I can't remember Laurent Fignon riding such an aggressive stage as this for years, and he's doing it now on his new team of Gatorade, free as a bird. Well, this is a great ride by Fignon. He was 14th overall this morning. Seven minutes, 54 seconds back, and now he's pulling time back on all of his rivals. Not too far behind on the slopes of the Grand Ballon. They're going to have to chase him down as they go over the top, because once he hits the high spot here over the top of the climb, this climb bringing Pignon up to 1,424 metres. It's being climbed today for only the fifth time in tour history. We go back to 1969 when the little Belgian climber, Lucien Van Imp, who won the King of the Mountains title six times to equal the record of Federico Badamontes of Spain. Now, Fignon has gone over the top in first place. He can add his name to the list, as now he decides whether he must go for it and a glance over his shoulder, a flick of the gears, and I guess we know the answer. Laurent Fignon now, winding his way down towards the valley, and heading down to the finish. And this is Javier Mergrialdi, who's trying to bridge the gap here to Laurent Fignon. He's recognised the danger of the escape by the Frenchman, but he's got a lot of chasing to do now, I think. Laurent Fignon, and now his car alongside him. But now the good news for Fignon, because the gap is hovering, and he's still holding on to a lead by some 30 seconds over the field. But he'll need more than that, I think, to survive. There's a little regroupment on the descent. With the field split up, there's some 40 or 50 riders, I would say, no more in that group coming off the mountain. And one of the riders who's missed the split is Jens Hepner. King of the Mountains, the polka dot jersey being worn on loan at the moment for Claudio Chiapucci. And going through there, leading for Benesto, Julian Garospe, very valuable rider on the Benesto team. It is a, such a strong team, Benesto. They are strong in just about every department required. Stephen Roach there having a word with Girotto. His teammate, 61 here, Andy Hampson from Motorola. Well, they're going to have to make a decision whether they chase or whether they allow Laurent Fignon his moment of glory here. He's not an immediate threat to the overall lead, and they know that, so it looks to me as though Bernesto have been told to limit the escape as best they can. There's those two minutes now, two minutes at 235 kilometres covered. That should be enough for Laurent Fignon. Fignon now clear. They're picking up the riders behind one by one. They go back into the field, but there's no determined chase here. They seem to have become a little bit disorganized on this chase down. No big teams have taken the lead, like Bernesto. We'd expect Bernesto. RMO know that Fignon immediately will not affect the overall lead. Pascal Lino surviving another day, and perhaps even to take this race now to the base of the Alps at least, as Fignon comes into town, and Laurent Fignon is clear now. This great man, Laurent Fignon, heading towards the finishing line, reliving those great days of 83 and 84. And the crowd appreciating this. This has been a superb ride by Laurent Fignon, and it'll go down as one of the most popular wins of this year's Tour de France, I'm sure of that. He doesn't say too much, but when he does, he says it emphatically. Laurent Fignon, the stage winner, and over the line there. And look at this, only just ahead of this small group by a handful of seconds. And it looks as though it's Per Pedersen leading out this small group. Laurent Dufault, the Helvetia on the left. Well, Pedersen gets second place, but the man of the day, Laurent Fignon. Bon, dernière petite question, juste en anglais, si tu peux répondre. How did it feel today to win a stage in the Tour de France after so long? It's been since 1989. <laughs> <laughs> a good joy because uh, it's very long uh, to since, uh, since 1989. Yes, thank you. So tonight you're a happy man. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yes, very much. <laughs> a very tired man as well, by the look of it. But Laurent Fignon recovering now to go on to the winners' podium. His victory today, though, some 22 seconds ahead of all of the men who matter in this Tour de France, and therefore the yellow jersey staying with Pascal Lino. Fignon winning ahead of Dufault, Per Pedersen and Ellie. Konishev was in fifth place. Overall, no change at all. Indurain, 1 minute 27 back, and Roach in third slot. 
And yesterday, the riders spending an enjoyable rest day in Dole, but now they face the first journey into the mountains and to the town of Saint-Gervais, which lies in the shadow of Mont Blanc. It's a long way. The crowd are in joyous mood, but the riders look a little bit glum. Everybody now expecting Claudio Chiapucci wearing the polka dot jersey of King of the Mountains to put in a challenge. Greg Lamond, he really doesn't know how he is feeling right now. Sometimes depressed, sometimes on a high note. Well, we're often asked how they do it on the road. Well, no one better to ask than the race leader, Pascal Lino. And the rider with him there is little uh, Charlie Motte, and in fact, to Motte complaining over the rest day that he is not well, and it looks to me as though he's told Pascal Lino here to go ahead, the team captain waving on the race leader, because I think Motte is about to pull out of the race. There was a rumour about this before the race start, and in fact, we're some 70 kilometres up the road here, and Charlie Motte is giving up the Tour de France. That really is a sad sight. What an amazing tour RMO have had. They lost Marcel Worst on the first day with a broken collarbone, They've dominated all of the classifications at some stage since then, and now the team leader is out. Gianni Bugno, he will have to make a move very soon if he's to take on Miguel Ingerain. And of course, there's still Pascal Lino to worry about as well. Stephen Roach on the far side of our picture, still having a great Tour de France. He really does look to me as though he's come back to his former greatness. Well, we're on the climb of the Col de Celeb here, and the pace is being pushed slowly here. But it's a long, tough climb, the Col de Soleil. I remember in 1973, Louis O'Connor laying the foundations of his final victory to the Tour de France. It was my first tour. I remember just how cruel these climbs really were. Pace being pushed by Benesto on the climb. And this will be Filippo, Fabrice Filippo in the lead. The Ario Ostia rider in the middle there is Rolf Yerman as they go over the top of the Col de Soleil. And I think the other one is Jörg Müller of the Helvetia team. It is indeed who's joined him at the back. They're the three leaders over the top of the Celeb. This is Perini. Perini is really having a surprising tour. He's already up there amongst the leaders. He's eighth overall at the moment, six minutes, 44 seconds back. And Perini having his best ever Tour de France. Taking on the bottles, going over the top of the Celeb. Chase behind here, Stephen Roach here. And it looks to me as though he's got Pedro Delgado for company. Two former winners of the Tour de France, 87 for Roach, 88 for Delgado. Delgado's now come up with Roach to Perini, and uh, Roach and Perini having words there. In fact, Stephen Roach speaks Italian, coming back to the Carrera team on which he won the Tour de France back in 1987. And I think he said to Perini, let's go for it because we've got the gap. Well, one man who hasn't got the gap here is Greg Lamond. He is in a difficulty on the lower slopes of the Col de Celeb. This is a sad sight. Le Monde had trouble in the Pyrenees last year when he couldn't follow the wheels. Miller, Robert Miller of Scotland and TVM has come alongside him. Well, Le Monde here is only a few seconds off the back of the pace being set by the main contenders in the Tour. If he can hang on to Robert Miller, he might get back up to them. And come round that hairpin bend. There they are. They are the leaders really chasing down. We've got three leaders over the top, just on four minutes ahead of Perini. And this group is about six and a half minutes down. It contains Kia Pucci, Jean-Francois Bernard, Miguel Indurain, Bunyo and Hampston. But Le Mans takes a look across the Neil Stevens of Australia, and I think Le Mans is in desperate trouble here on the Celeb because he's having trouble holding on. Let's go back up towards the leaders. This is Stephen Roach and Delgado looking across there to see if he can understand what is transpiring. I'm not too sure whether Pedro Delgado understands Italian or not but they are still a little bit off the pace. They're about five minutes behind the three leaders at the moment. And further back down, the yellow jersey here of Pascal Lino. They're regrouping as they come over the Col de Celeb. And this is a sad sight because this is Yogi Muller here. He's gone clear on his own because he managed to drop Yerman and Filippo, and they've been picked up by Delgado and Stephen Roach. But the chance of a stage victory, I think he's resigned himself to his capture again. He's looking over, he's seen them coming, I think. And Jürgen Müller now taking a little bit of food on board for the last few kilometres towards the finish. And here is the train, led by Perini. Roach is in there, Delgado, Filippo and Rolf Yerman, the former champion of Switzerland, in the Ariostia colours there, just moving up the line a little bit. So that is a shame. And Müller has found the strength, though, to get on to the back end of this little breakaway group. They're still three minutes ahead of the chase, which is generally reformed behind now. Johan Museo is in here, so it can't be that hard if the non-climbing champion of Belgium has got back into the main field and a general regroupment on the road. 
Pascal Lino. Then people predicting today he would lose his overall lead to Miguel Indurain. And it's not to be, I would say, because he's in that group alongside Indurain. But a chance now on this little final climb up towards the finish at San Gervais for Stephen Roach to make amends. He almost won the stage when we came into Holland in Volkenberg. He was beaten there by Gilles de Leon. Now will he have another crack at it? He's got a tough man to beat in Pedro Delgado. He's the policeman today for Miguel Indurain. And Delgado himself not yet free to try and win this Tour de France. I think he's already resigned that he's going to be the super domestique for Miguel Indurain this year. Delgado is ninth overall and seven minutes and a single second back of Pascal Lino. A long climb up to San Gervais, third category in the rankings for the King of the Mountains, but you know it really is a tough climb. We go under the banner here, five kilometres, that's three miles still to go. Well, Roche's pace has got rid of Filippo Amperini, and Delgado looks to be in a little bit of trouble. Yerman looks round to see where he is, and look at this. I do believe that Delgado is bluffing there. He's gone on the left-hand side. Yerman's seen him come, but Stephen Roach has got no way of lifting the pace. He's been at full rivet all of the way up this climb, and Roach has dropped off. Delgado, though, his move has been blocked here by Rolf Yerman. So the Swiss has a chance here because Delgado is renowned for his non-sprinting ability. He tries to outclimb his rivals, and perhaps this climb isn't steep enough for the champion of Spain. And that is purely in the sense that he is a champion and not the reigning champion, by the way. That's Miguel Indurain winning the title just before this race began. Well, the finish, and look at the face here of Delgado. We're now in to the foothills of the Alps, and Delgado in his playground, bringing up Rolf Jürgen, himself a great climber. Almost a winner of Valkenberg. He made the run for the line at Fair Lem, but will he make it this time? Because Jürgen goes, and I don't think Delgado will come back. Rolf Jürgen's made no mistake this time. He's waited till the last possible moment. He gets his stage win at last, and he's delighted with it. The Ariostia rider wins the stage here to San Gervais. Over seven hours in the saddle today. Pedro Delgado in second place. And Stephen Rose comes over the line in third. Well, that has been a great ride by Stephen Roach. He's totally exhausted here. He's using the barrier of the commentary position to prop himself up. And Stephen Roach exhausted, but I hope at least a little happy. Well, the face of anxiety here, Stephen Roach, but at least he does seem to be coming back to his old form. And all he wants is a little bit of room. Stephen, this is turning out to be a very tactical race, but you seem to be rising to the occasion again, as you did a couple of years ago. Well, I was always fairly good as regards tactics. At the moment, I maybe haven't got the condition as the other guys have because I well, haven't had a full, a full season in the last four years, so I'm kind of lacking a bit of a, a bit of foundation because I'm a bit under pressure in the mountains, so I just got to take the chances when they come, you know. But today, Delgado rode uh, as a teammate, but you can put yourself in the same position too if Chiapucci goes away. The problem is, Kipuchi won't go. Well, he, Kipuchi goes away, never goes on his own, so I never have the opportunity to sit in the wheels. <laughs> Tomorrow's a very hard stage. We're going over some very big climbs. You've got a problem with your back. Do you think it's going to be a major problem for you? Or will you get through? Well, it's maybe a general problem. You know, I am. Uh, the last few days, yesterday, I haven't been great in the mountains. Like I feel I'm a little under pressure in the mountains because of my back and that. But um, just every day is another day, so I'll see what comes tomorrow. Were you feeling confident for this stage? The next, the next two stages are going to be very hard. Just take, take what comes, Paul. You know, we're expecting to kind of try and do well in the tour, and so far I've done ex exceptionally well. So whatever comes now, I just have to take it. So you're pretty happy the way things are going. Definitely. You know, it's four years since I had this kind of form, so it's, it's kind of I means still have a future in this game. You know. <laughs> <laughs> you certainly do, Stephen, as he holds on to third place overall and finishes third on the stage today as well. Indurain still holds on second. Lino keeps the yellow jersey on the road to Sestriere. And so on to our seventh country, the race now heading into Italy. So Pascal Lino has proved to be a very solid leader of the Tour de France, but if the truth were known, Indurain really has never put him under stress. He hasn't attacked him yet. Today we expect to see that all change. We're now in the Alps for two of the toughest days for many, many years. The overall situation, just a quick reminder, 1 minute 27 seconds between Lino and Indurain, 1 minute 58 to the third man, Stephen Roach, and 4 minutes and 8 seconds to Pedro Delgado. Let's get back to the action. And what action it is, because Pascal Lino today must feel very unsafe. 165 riders rolling away now from saint gervais Mont Blanc, heading across the borders into Italy and Sestria. They face one second category climb, three premier category climbs, that's the first category, and one all category climb, the climb of the Col de Liseron. 
attacks coming right away from the start. And Claudio Chiapucci, the man who started them all, he never, never stops racing this rider. Chiapucci, first over the top there, the Col de Saisy, after just 31 and a half kilometers. And that's the second category climb right behind him now. And he's already out on the attack. Chiapucci attacking today almost from the drop of the flag. And this very, very quick tour goes on and on. The riders never seem to know when to call a truce this year. It's been a superb tour to watch and report. Under pressure all of the time. Chiapucci, by the way, 4 minutes 54 seconds behind today in 7th place and now in the leading breakaway already. Being joined on the attack there with Pelo Ruiz Cabastani to the right of our picture. Cabastani, a Spanish rider, rides on an Italian team and I'll tell you too, he speaks fluent English as well. Tilly Claverol, a little Frenchman, former King of the Mountains, the jersey that Chiapucci is wearing today and this attack is looking very, very good indeed. Chiapucci, you know, is gaining time rapidly here. And the group is swelling up behind him as he steps on the pedals. Tilly Claverola, this little rider who rode so well in the United States this year in the Tour du Pont in the defense of Greg Lamont, who ran out the winner of that race. It was Tilly Claverola that set the pace up to Wintergreen Resort that kept Lamont in with a real shout. And then Lamont finished it off with the yellow jersey at the end. Well, this is tremendous climbing prowess here by Claudio Chiapucci. This is a day of attack, and we haven't seen hide and hair of Miguel Ingerain, nor indeed of the yellow jersey. Luc Leblanc is in trouble. The champion of France is in a little bit of trouble here. And just look at this now. Castor Armour rider who won the French championship just before the start of the Tour de France. He came here very, very confident indeed. He's now being forced here onto the wheel of his teammate. Jean-Claude Bago. So the race continues to climb high into the Alps. This is a superb breakaway by Claudio Chiapucci. This man, you know, he never thinks of what might bring on the morrow. He just starts attacking and keeps on going as long as he possibly can. And just look at some of the face of these riders. They look down to the dizzy slope. Sean Kelly is up here too. Gonzalez in this break. Perez, Boltz, Gaston. And this is a nice little breakaway. Some 10 riders here that have developed on the climb of the Cormet de Roseland. And a beautiful scenery. And at last, we've got a nice day in the Tour de France. Laurent Fignon, the winner of a stage only the other day, but now having to take his place behind the wheel of Miguel Ingerain. It looks really cool there. Greg Lamond riding a lot better today as well. And number 29 on the far side there, Fabio Roccioli. He's had his moments in this year's Tour de France. Coccioli going through the picture. Franco Coccioli riding his first Tour de France. And you know, he's in his early 30s now. And he's not really produced the ride he was hoping for. He hasn't challenged for the yellow jersey at all. Coming up towards the top then of the Corme de Roseland. Sean Kelly there, sitting at the back of that group. Now time for the chance to snatch a bit of food and start the long descent. And this is the main field going over with the yellow jersey in there. They're timed at a minute and 10 seconds down on that breakaway, which is 10 riders strong. And this is one rider who's found himself between the break and the main field because this is Sean Yates of Great Britain and the Motorola team, a new champion of Great Britain at that. Yates was in that leading group, which originally was 15 riders strong. He's been dropped on the climb. Now it's a question of whether he will be prepared to take the chances here to get back up to that group on the descent. He went over the top of the mountain, not too far ahead of the peloton, and approximately a minute down on the leaders on the road. Well, there they are, and this has been a great descent by Sean Yates. A surprising rider, Sean. He's pulled off some great wins in his career, but basically he's the strong man of the Motorola team. When they want pure speed, they send Sean Yates to the front. Here he is, though, up in a very early breakaway today in what is the hilliest stage of the Tour de France thus far. Little bit of a problem threading through the following cars, but the roads are narrow and he's through with no trouble. Heading up now towards the next climb, the Col de Liseron. This is the big one here. It was all around this area in February where the Winter Olympics were held and based in Albaville. And it wasn't the time to come and look at this mountain because it was covered in snow. But just look at the pace now by the man in the polka dot jersey. He's placed the yellow jersey in serious problems here. Pascal Lino is a long, long way back, further down the Col de Liseron. Claudio Chiapucci has not waited for the last climbs of the stage to put in an attack. He's gone right at the beginning. He's done this before in previous Tours de France. It must be causing consternation amongst the leaders. 
And this is the best of the rest, as it were. They're trying to reform behind. Greg Lamond is in this group. He's in trouble on the Col de Lisieron. Greg Lamond struggling a little bit in that group. Let's go further forward of Greg Lamond's group because here's Miguel Injurain. Look at the difference in tempo now. Miguel Injurain, the centre of our picture, riding very solidly indeed. It's Alonso who's riding on Injurain's right. Robert Miller, his jersey unzipped all the way down, also setting the table. Lamond in desperate trouble again, just as he was in the Pyrenees one year ago. Lamond is going backwards today and backwards very, very quickly indeed. And that is a sad sight. I think Greg secretly, you know, has been worried about these mountains coming each day. He's tried throughout this Tour de France to gain time on the flatter stages to give himself a better springboard into the Alps, and it hasn't come. And this is the rider who is destroying Greg Lamont today. Claudio Chiapucci, second in the Tour de France last year, second for the last two years in the Tour of Italy. He's attacked virtually at the drop of the flag today, and now he's tapping out the rhythm all by himself. The breakaway he has shredded on this climb of the Iseron. This great mountain which brings the riders up to 2,770 metres, and it's being climbed today for only the sixth time in history. You know, we haven't been up the Col d'Isoron since 1963. That means none of the current generation of professional bike riders have ever raced up this mountain in the Tour de France. And just look at this over the top of the climb. Over the top first then, no doubt about it. Now, this is an escape of magnitude by uh, Claudio Chiapucci. And Pascal Lino is also being forced to climb better than he's ever climbed in his life before defending his 10th day in the yellow jersey in the Tour de France. It seems weeks ago now when he took the lead in Bordeaux, but now he has the rendezvous with the big mountains. And Kiepucci in no hurry to push home his advantage. He's heading rapidly now to becoming the race leader of the Tour de France on the road. And the rest of the riders are going to have to chase him down if they want to. Over the top of the Col de Lizeron, and that is Conti, Roberto Conti going over ahead of Richard Berink. Well, they're timed at 2 minutes 20 seconds down, and it's been a great defence by Lino. He's going over there, only two and a half minutes back. He was with Franco Chioccioli, and this is the Injurain Bugno Roach Delgado main group, and some 35 riders in this group. And Le Mans, I think, is just tailed off the back of them. They're going over the top at 3 minutes 45 seconds back. And that is not a lot when you think that there's still plenty of climbing to come today, including the finished Sestria. Here's Greg. He's just been tailed off the back. He's certainly not out of this race yet. He snatches a newspaper there to go up his jumper for the long descent down to the bottom. He's timed at around 18 seconds behind that group containing Indurain and company. So Le Monde looking a little bit jaded here, but still very much in with a shout. And the American flag's trying to raise Greg as he goes under the finishing banner of the Col de Liseron. Still to come, the climb of the Col de mont the premier category climb, and followed by the finishing climb at 254 kilometres of Sestriere. Well, they used to laugh at Claudio Chiapucci, and they don't laugh at him anymore. If we had 10 Claudio Chiapucci in the Tour de France, I don't think we'd be more than 10 finishers. This rider never knows when to stop racing. And don't forget, the magnet of his home country now, he's being drawn towards Sestriere. 1952, the Tour de France had ended in Sestriere with a stage, and the winner then, none less than Fausto Coppi, in many people's eyes, the greatest cyclist who ever lived. And Coppi now will be delighted at the way this young man is taking the riders on in the Tour de France today. Bunyo must be a little confused today as he rides alongside his teammate Alonso. Bunyo really has been very disappointing in this Tour de France. He lost over three minutes, lost in fact three minutes 40 seconds in the time trial in Luxembourg. That must have done an awful lot of damage to his confidence. I said that was Alonso, by the way, it's Rondon. Abelardo Rondon of the Gatorade team alongside him. Alonso is the teammate of Benesto leader in Jirain. Get John Ternis on the far side of our picture. We've not seen too much of him either in this year's Tour de France. Now riding with a very select group indeed. As we continue to move along this line of riders here, this is the group beginning to splinter. An attack there by Bunyo, and it, uh, it's Rondon, this great climber, who's leading out Bunyo and launching him into attack here. It looks to me as though Indurain himself has climbed his way steadily up to the back wheel of the world champion. So there's no doubt then who Indurain considers his main challenger for this year's Tour de France. As we go up to the top of the climb now of the Col de mont and it's still the same man at the front. He's won every climb today in the Alps 
and that is going to give him a near unassailable lead in the King of the Mountains competition. As they come up towards the top of the climb, we've got Bunyo and Injure now chasing them down. So the big names, it's been a struggle, but they've forced their way to the front here. Three minutes and 33 seconds down on Claudio Chiapucci, that's a long way. And Chiapucci is still the leader on the road because this is a lot further back now to the climbing there of Lino. He's had a bad climb on Monsigny. And Andy Hampson's had a much better climb. He's come right up to the four here. Goes over in fourth place with him is Franco Vona. They are just over four minutes down on Claudio Chiapucci. And so they're chasing now down the other side of the climb of the Mont Chenis. And if you look up the road, down there below us, and it is the world champion in the slipstream of Miguel Indurain. And the Mayo Jean, by the way, Lino, is five and a half minutes down on Chiapucci, and that will keep him out of the yellow jersey. Chiapucci could be in yellow tonight. The man he's got to worry about, and indeed the man who's worried about him, is Miguel Indurain. He is now trying to chase down uh, Claudio Chiapucci, and that is going to be some chase. They've been joined there. So it looks as though Bunyo, Indurain, Hampson and Vona have got themselves together. Oh dear me, look at the face now of Claudio Chiapucci because he's on the last climb. This is the climb up to Sestriere itself. Surely he's not going to crack now. This has been an escape of magnitude. Some 190 kilometres in the lead so far for Claudio Chiapucci. And this will go in the history books as one of the escapes of any Tour de France in modern times. Indurain knows it too. And this is the first time we've seen Indurain come out in this race and have to take on the racing himself and not rely on his team to close this race down. The only time that Indurain has really put his own effort into this race has been in the first time trial at Luxembourg. He built himself such a comfortable lead there. He hasn't really had a chance or wanted to to do anything so far. But now he knows if he's going to save this Tour de France, he's got to stop Clear Pucci and he's got to stop him today. So Indurain. Bunyo alongside, and Bunyo will be content to see Indurain spend his energy now, maybe to find chance to attack him tomorrow on the long road to Alpe d'Huez, where he's won for the last two years, and indeed the only Italian ever to win, apart from Fausto Coppi, way back in 1952. Well, the crowd have been watching this on television, and they've been watching this rider out in front for four hours today. They've been watching him come slowly towards him, towards them rather, and Kia Pucci now surely can't lose this stage. And Bunyo's in trouble. Well, look at this. There's been an acceleration on the front. It was Franco Vona who's turned the screw a little tighter. And this has caused Bunyo to be in a spot of trouble. And I'm sure that Indurain has noted that. Well, he hasn't done a lot. He's tried to follow Indurain. And he's still lost ground here. So Bunyo will be very, very unhappy with his form so far in this year's Tour de France. Long, long, steady climb. This brings them up to the top in Sestria. Big crowd are waiting too, and Hampson is also in trouble here. Andy Hampson has tailed off. He falls back here to Miguel Indurain. Our camera's not allowed to go past these two riders by the international race referees. So we'll go back up and join Claudio Chiapucci. The gap is still there. It's coming down at the start of this climb with 10 kilometers to go to the top. That's six miles. He was leading by two minutes and 20 seconds on those four riders we've just seen, but they've split up now. Franco Vona here also trying to have a little go. The cheers of Bunyo on the right of our picture there. Indurain, Indurain trying to make his attempt here now to open up the gap. He's got to close this gap down. It's man on man now. Indurain isn't worried about his finished position today. He's more worried about the actual time gains of Claudio Chiapucci, who could be heading for the Mayo Jaune right now because Pascal Lino is in terrible trouble and losing a lot of time today. Yellow jersey could be the return now after this marvellous ride by Claudio Chiapucci. will go down as one of the finest escapes I've ever seen in any of 20 tours to France, and the Italians know it too. They're trying to coax, pull and drag their man home in Italy. The Tour de France very rarely makes an incursion into Italy, and surely now they're not going to allow Claudio Chiapucci to lose not just the stage win, but the manner in which he has won this race. He's not been afraid of anybody in this year's tour. He's attacked the minutes this stage has started, and I can't believe when he attacked at the beginning of today's stage of 254 kilometers, he really expected to be in this position now, coming up to the finish. Look at this crowd. And even the motorbikes are in the way now, and this is really unfortunate because you lose your rhythm. 
And actually, Keir Putchy just asking the crowd to pull back, let him see the road to the finish, please, at Sestriere. It's not just for the stage win. Every push of those pedals is gaining time, he hopes, but Injure now is trying desperately to breach the gap. Franco Vona, by the way, is lodged in between these two. But our camera's staying rightly on the one-on-one -on -one battle. And Injurain, knowing that it could be the yellow jersey that awaits him at the finish tonight, if he can control the attack now by Kia Pucci. He was the man with the most to gain at the start. He started in second place overall. He will know, as well as everybody else now, that the yellow jersey of Pascal Lino has cracked on this mounted stage of Sestria. Kia Pucci trying desperately to pull time away from Injurain. One kilometre to go. Injurain is closing the gap slowly but ever so slowly. The gap was two minutes. It's now inside a minute and three quarters. And Franco Vona lost somewhere between the two, and nobody really minding that. So the arrival of Claudio Chiappucci, and this will be remembered as one of the finest escapes in the history of the Tour de France in the manner of Fausto Coppi. All he's got to do now is hang on just long enough to come to the finishing line. All of his folks are waiting for him in Sestria. He's climbed over the top of the Col de Saisy, the Cornet de Roselon, the Col de Liseron, the Col de Montchenny. And now the climb at Sestria. Maximum points today in the King of the Mountains. Maximum in the accolade stakes as well for Claudio Chiappucci. Time will tell whether he's done enough to take the overall lead. He certainly stitched up the King of the Mountains in this year's Tour de France. And just look at this now, the moment of adulation. Claudio Chiappucci has pulled off one of the finest rides in the modern history of the Tour de France in the manner of that great campionissimo Fausto Coppi. He'll go down in the history books by the end of this stage and his face tells the story. Franco Vona, we see him at last. Locked in between the battle between Indurain and Chiappucci. Vona coming in. Franco Vona arriving one minute, 34 seconds back. And Indurain almost catching him. And, you know, this will be enough to give Indurain the yellow jersey. He's finishing about one and three quarter minutes down on Claudio Chiappucci. We know that Lino is a long, long way behind today. So Indurain will now be the new leader of the Tour de France. Bunyo has been forced to try and counter the moves of the stars today. He looks terrible here. He's coming home in fourth place, but almost three minutes back. World champion, finishing in fourth slot. And the lonely figure of Andy Hampson. This was the breakaway group that has shaped the race of today. Hampson, like Bunyo, cracked on the climb up to Sestria. But this will also assure Andy Hampson now of a high position in the overall classification. He'll move up into the top ten. And his time gap somewhere around three and a half minutes. Problem riding at distances like today's distance, and yet you only finished one minute, 30 seconds behind Indurain. You must be pretty pleased with that performance. Yeah, usually um, something this long, it's just my motor doesn't hold up. Um, you know, but I was taking care of myself today. I had a little bit of problem. I caught a bunch of plastic in my bike and screwed up my gears halfway up the uh, last 10 Ks, but limited my losses. and. No, I'm pleased, you know, usually that's, that's not where I'm good. But after a hard stage like today, how can you think about tomorrow? Because you've got to try and do the same thing again. Any thoughts for Alduez? I'm not thinking about tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you, Andy, and I suspect that neither is Claudio Chiappucci. Chiappucci said after the finish that it would be up to the journalist to decide if his ride was a historical one or not. It certainly was. He finished ahead of Vona and Indurain. Indurain, though, the new leader now by a minute and 42 seconds ahead. Chiappucci. And now they face the stage they've talked about since the route was announced last October. The long ride to Alpe d'Huez with the vicious climbs of the Col de Galibier, the Col de la Croix de Fer and the Alpe d'Huez itself. And it all begins as they leave Sestrier immediately. After only seven kilometres, they find themselves here on the climb of the Col de Montgenevre. And at the start this morning, the devastation of yesterday was there for all to see. 18 riders had abandoned or given up or been eliminated in the Tour de France yesterday. Greg Le Mans had survived, but by the skin of his teeth, 49 minutes he lost yesterday, and Le Mans was not expected even to come out to the start. But he did, but he was in trouble right at the start of the climb and was already being tailed off by the big field. The climb, Col de Mont Genevre, second category climb, is really a very vicious introduction to the three big mountains to come. 
The Bonesto team are now trying to get some sort of order in this race and look after their team leader in the new yellow jersey of Miguel Indurain. Everybody felt this was the way the Tour de France was going. Now he had the lead, he would be able to keep it. But what was Claudio Chiapucci thinking? Because here was a rider now, surely he must be exhausted after that breakaway of over 200 kilometers only yesterday. The face of Miguel Indurain giving nothing away, but I think the face of Greg Lamont here was giving everything away. He was now in big trouble on this climb. As he starts the climb, he was tailed. Gilbert Duclosal is the rider who's gone back to try and help him out. His faithful Z teammate, winner this year at Paris Roubaix. The pressure at the front continues. Yannick Bunyo here. Neil Stevens riding extremely well, but Bunyo trying to escape very early on here. Bunyo needs to do something now. Franco Ciaccioli too. That's at the front. We're now at the back of the race here. The cameras are hovering here with Greg Lamont, expecting him to throw in the towel. He had a bad tour last year in the, in the Alps, in the Pyrenees rather. Now we're in the Alps, he's in trouble again. And at the front, this breakaway trying desperately to establish something. We're onto the climb now of the Col de Galibier. And it goes up via the climb of the Col de Lotteret, which doesn't even warrant as a noted climb in this year's Tour de France. Look at, oh dear me. And that is the fault of a spectator. And Bunyo has made that quite apparent. Bunyo brought down with about a kilometre or so from the summit of the Galibier. Robert Miller also on the floor. So Miller trying to get going again. And the spectators pushing Miller back into the fray. And Bunyo already off up the road. A little helping hand here for Robert to try and get back through. But that really is too bad, you know. They shouldn't have got that close on that tight left hander. Maybe they didn't see them coming up, but that is a shame. Miller's now going to have to thread his way around the cars here. Now, this is the sort of attack that Miller would have tried to have done today. He's done it before. Let's have a look at that slow motion again. Watch the left of the picture. Bunyo hits the, the spectator in the pink there. Fignon dodges it nicely, and ouch. Uh, Bunyo made his feelings felt there. And unfortunately, Miller too, and here he is now trying to get back up to the leaders. And look at that drop. If you go off the edge there, well, you need a parachute, don't you? Miller going back up towards the leaders to be climbed to the top of the Col de Galibier. The main field is not split up too much as far as the main strongmen. This is Franco Ciaccioli here. And he's trying now to force the issue and really distinguish himself in this year's Tour de France. Now no longer seen as a likely winner of this race. Perhaps he feels he's got the chance to establish his lead over the top of the Col de Galibier for Coccioli. And now the long descent before they start the climb of the Col de Croix de Fer. That really is a vicious climb. Laurent Fignon again in action, but now thinking more of helping his teammate and team leader, Gianni Bugno. Fignon over the top, followed by Bugno. And Bugno at last is out on the attack. Claudio Chiapucci, he doesn't really seem to be showing signs of fatigue after that long breakaway yesterday. And Indurain is right within there. Robert Miller, too, is up in this group. Pascal Lina, not too far away. The rider who yesterday lost his leader's yellow jersey. But Greg Lamont is in all sorts of trouble here. He's climbing alone at the bottom of the climb. Gilbert Duclos Lazal was with him, but he's now over 15 minutes off the lead. And Greg Lamont is in big trouble. There is Gilbert Duclos Lazal. He's still trying to hang back and coax Greg to the top of the Galibier. Over the top of the Galibier for Greg Lamont. But you know, with the Col de la Croix de Fer to come and the long climb of Alduez, Greg Lamont now is in real danger of being eliminated from this Tour de France. Fignon, no thoughts of worrying where Greg is right now. He's driving this little group on over the top of the Galibier. Coccioli hugging his back wheel nicely. The world champion, Gianni Bugno. And the Once rider up here is Neil Stevens and must be asking himself what on earth he's doing with this sort of talent because with every respect to Neil, and he's a good mate of mine, Stevens knows he can't climb like these boys. And now how to gain time on the way down. Clipping the edges of the herpin bends there. Bugno anxious now. But it's too late because Indurain has crossed the gap. Indurain is up there. That group has reformed. Bugno is now in this group containing Indurain, having to take the wheel of the yellow jersey. Chiapucci is here. Stevens is still here. There's Franco Ciaccioli sitting at the back of this very select group of riders. And this rider here, just about her hanging on, is Pascal, is Fernando Pinero of the Festina team, and this little group is becoming very select indeed, and it's getting bigger by the minute. An attack by the Z team. This is Eric Boyer. Again, a rider who has had his moments in the Tour de France, and the man responsible for nursing Greg Lamont through last year's tour on that hilly stage to Val Lorenz in the Pyrenees. But now, the news is, Lamont is in all difficulties and approaching the village of Saint-Jean-de-Maurienne, which is the feeding station. 
And there's a long way behind this group now, trying to fight out the situation as they hit the Col de la Croix de Fer. Coccioli has had his moments today, but he's been joined by the select group of riders at the front. And this is Franco Coccioli, who's been in the frame all day, Eric Boyer of the Z team, and that is Jesus Montoya of the Almighty. Andy Hampson is now up here, and Jan Navens, there's a surprise. Jan Navens, the winner of one stage of this year's Tour de France, that in itself was a bit of a shock down in Koblenz. And now he's on this very select group on the climb here of the Col de la Croix de Fer. Well, we saw the attack a little bit early on by Pinero, but he's been caught and passed, and now there's trouble way down the mountain for Greg LeMond. LeMond here is discussing the day with Roger Lezé, and we're now in the village here of Saint-Jean-de-Maurienne. It's the feeding station, and you know, I think this is the end for Greg LeMond. He's not going on, he's refusing the food there, and I think he's no choice, really, because if he were to go on, I think he would be eliminated from the Tour de France today, and this is a sad sight. Greg LeMond, the three-time winner, being forced for the first time in his career to abandon the Tour de France. It's all over for him. So, all the promise of what he might do after that great win in the Tour du Pont, it's not come to anything in the Tour de France. This has been just simply too quick for him. On the very first day, they've run off at record speeds. It's destroyed more morale than just Greg LeMond's too, I can tell you. Gianni Bugno, who's still very much in with a chance, but no longer, in my opinion, of winning this Tour de France. He's now going to have to try and salvage a very good finish, though, in Paris. This is the group away, it's causing all the trouble. Jesus Montoya on the left in the Amaya colours. Jan Navens, Andy Hampson, Franco Bona. But also now another man suffering a little bit further down the slope is Stephen Roach of the Carrera team. And the heat of the day now as they head out on the Col de la Croix de Fer. And they know that when they're over the top of this, they still have to climb all the way up to Alpe d'Huez. Sean Kelly, the grand winner, just peeping into our picture on the right here of Milan San Remo this year, up on the far side. Just out of our picture now is Coccioli, Tiddy Clavarola. Oh, and dear me, look at the face now of this great Frenchman. Laurent Fignon once rode to the top of Alpe d'Huez and claimed the yellow jersey and went on to win the Tour de France. That's not going to happen today. He said no to a drink. He continues to climb. Well, if you weren't going to Alpe d'Huez, the place to come and watch the Tour de France in any year is on the narrow approach here of the Col de la Croix de Fer. I never know where they put all the cars, but the people always come in their thousands. And these are the leading riders now, led over the top there by Eric Boyer, going over the top of the Croix de Fer. Very, very difficult climb indeed. It might be the thought of climbing this that inspired Greg LeMond uh, to stop where he did. Just look at the crowd there. There's still a sizable group here trying to organize the chase, led up there by the yellow jersey of Miguel Ingerain. A very select group of climbers. Now do Chiapucci, the king of the mountains of this year's Tour de France, dancing along nicely on the side of Miguel Ingerain. Robert Miller's still there too, sitting on the back of this group as they come up towards the top of the climb. So Ingerain now, still the yellow jersey, with his closest rivals around him. The only man he'd be a little concerned about is Andy Hampston, who's up in the lead. As they head off now, all the way down to the valley road that will take them into bourg -Doison. Then they'll turn left in the town of bourg -Doison and begin the long climb up to the top of Alpe d'Huez. The reservoirs in the beautiful valley here. Andy Hampston now showing to be a real champion rider today. He's taken this Tour de France by the scruff of the neck and he's trying to put in a top performance. Bunyo patrolling the peloton. And to his right there was the Mexican Raul Alcala. The 20 kilometers to go banner. They know now that most of this will be uphill because the climb of Alpe d'Huez is still to come. This is the valley approach that brings them into Bourg Doison. And this side of a little group of five men is still holding on to a considerable lead over the chase. And Kia Pucci having a much quieter day for him, but still showing no signs of fatigue from that ride yesterday. There he is to the left of our picture. Injurain sitting to the right, and again, as soon as they hit the slopes, look at the acceleration by Kia Pucci. And Injurain spotting the move straight away, coming straight out of the field. We're now on the base slopes of Alpe d'Huez, with the 21 hairpin bends to the summit. And Claudio looks over his shoulder to see who's joined him, and no surprise, it's the yellow jersey. Well, this is a superb piece of riding yet again by Indurain. 
The rider up front they should be worried about is some near five minute lead still for Andy Hampson's group. And here they are, Hampson on the left, Franco Vona. Jan Navens, the big surprise yet again, hanging on at the back, and goodness knows how he's feeling on this climb because Hampson is a great climber. Vona is having a marvellous couple of days here in the Alps. He was second to Sestria. And just look at this now, the water being given by the fans. They've been out, as always, coming here some three days before the Tour Riders to claim their spot on the slopes. Many of the spectators here have been coming for as long as the Tour has been coming here and always taking the same position. This is the 17th time the Tour de France has finished on top of Alpe d'Huez. In itself, it only goes up to just over 1,800 metres, but it is the way it climbs up so steeply in the village of Bourg d'Oison that makes it so difficult. And the very first winner up here, back in 1952, was Fausto Coppi. And look at this now, the pace by Hampston, and he's put Boyer in trouble. So Eric Boyer, who's trying to take over the mantle from Greg Lamond on the climb of Alpe d'Huez, is in trouble and being detached here. Nevins has already gone, I'm not surprised about that. But Vona is hanging on to Andy Hampson. I've never seen Andy look so good on a climb for years. And it's Keir Pucci who's setting the pace, and again, Indurain is following. He could be criticised for that, Miguel Indurain, because this great man is so calculated, and Andy Hampson wants no more water over the back of the neck, and nobody else to pat him on the shoulder either. He's made that pretty plain. You can't blame him. I think the crowd sometimes don't realise the sort of pressure that a professional bike rider is under at this point of the race. Hampson wants no water because he's not hot, and in fact, it'll send the shivers down his back. About halfway up the climb here now, and Vona is looking to be a little bit fallible as well. Andy Hampson hasn't eased at all. He hasn't even looked round to see what damage he's caused this breakaway for. This is a classic ride. He started the climb, he immediately at the start of the climb, he set the pace, and one by one, he's watched his rivals drop away. The man from Boulder, Colorado, Turned professional back in 1985, and then he moved over to Italy. Of course, we all know he won the Tour of Switzerland in 1986, and that was America's first big success in the stage races. And now he's having the greatest moment of his career, I would suggest, because this is a stage everybody wants to win. Sitting in the back here is Richard Varenk, who's had a marvellous tour, his first Tour de France, an early leader, leader in the King of the Mountains, and on points as well as the yellow jersey. Again, trying to make the selection today, assuring himself of a high finish in Paris. Indurain, at last, he's gone to the front along with Kia Pucci. And once the pace has increased there, well, they pulled away nicely from that leading group and they shed them all one by one as well. This rider in trouble at the back now, Vona, just under two kilometres to go. Franco Vona, though, is hanging on to second place on the road. That's not bad, is it? Second yesterday behind Kia Pucci after that wonderful escape by him. And now in second place again here on Alpe d'Huez. That's a great weekend, but the Spaniard, or rather the Italian, has been forced to follow in the shadow of two great bike riders these last two days. He's one of them, Claudio Chiapucci. The crowd at his thickest now, we're into the chalets, and for Andy Hampson, he's one kilometre from the finish, twice winner of the Tour of Switzerland, the winner of the Tour of Italy in 1988. Well, this ride isn't going to win in the Tour de France yet, but it's certainly going to move him up the overall classification by quite a long way. He was eighth at the start of the stage today, and this is a ride and a half. Well, he told us last night he wasn't thinking of today's stage. Surely he must have planned this. Andy Hampson and the Motorola team, they were one stage last year, the first year of sponsorship with Phil Anderson, and now Andy Hampson is going to give them, really, the finest stage they could possibly hope for. A look over his shoulder, no one there, Andy. And Andy Hampston waves to the crowd, a great finish indeed for Andy Hampston. Vona will come over in second place, and Bowie and Nevins will not be too far behind, but that's the order of finish at Alpe d'Huez. The man of the day, there's no doubt who that was. Andy Hampson has pulled off the ride of his life here. And thank heavens that the organisation has held the crowd back because you need all the air you can get when you climb to the top of Alpe d'Huez. Hampston half carried, half dragged away around the back of the stands as winner of this stage of the Tour de France today. He's won it by a minute and 17 seconds ahead of Franco Vona and two minutes, eight seconds back to Eric Boyer. Indurain has just come in, three minutes, 15 seconds down, but that will keep him in the overall lead as Andy Hampston thinks only now of the great moment and the $10,000 first prize 
for being the king of outdoers today. And so John Hender shot, the team Masser done a good job. Andy Hampson looks now as though he's hardly ridden the race, does he? And a salute to the crowd for Andy Hampson, who will climb up now to third overall. That's going to be one of the, that's got to be one of the sweetest days of your life. I tell you, that's all I've ever wanted in my whole career is just really good form and a good mountain show it on and can't ask for more than half a million people to cheer me on. To win at the, the top of the Al Duez for a climber must be absolutely extraordinary. How did you feel with 500 meters to go? I felt pretty good. It was downhill. Uh, you know, I was really rode my own tempo. I wasn't sure if I'd win today because when the attack went, you know, we we're all equal. <laughs> it went, you know, on the lower part of the quad of it. <laughs> Quite a fair, and I knew that today everyone in that group was pretty equal. So I wasn't thinking so much of winning the stage, so much as just really do my fastest ride on the way up. So I did tempo the entire way. You know, and about halfway, I started pushing it, and I could see they're in difficulty. So I uh, felt I could make to the finish and really gave it the stick. But when you came on the scene, you were one of the most fantastic climbers. And you sort of disappeared for a few years, but now this year you seem to have changed. Your mentality's changed, your training's changed. What's happened to you? Oh, I don't know. I think before I won a lot of races, just uh, maybe I was a bit naive and had a lot of youthful enthusiasm. Now I'm an old dog. But, uh, you know, I work hard. I've been training real hard. Um, I've had a lot of disappointments, so anything that comes is is a gift and I, I look at it as a gift and not a you know I don't have a quota of races I win a year every time I'm in good form I really have to make the most of it and when it's a day like this it's it's so much the better one last question uh, today we saw the withdrawal of Greg Lamont is that sad for you to see Lamont going out to the race in such a way yeah you know I haven't really talked to him enough <coughs> to know <coughs> what's wrong with him but uh, yeah it's kind of sad because you know I started racing racing with Greg you know, I remember uh, I was hired the first year as a pro to help him win, and he, you know, on this stage he was, you know, tied with our own teammate. So, you know, it's too bad, but uh, we've all been there, and we've all know how to come back. Well, today wasn't Greg Lamont's day, it was Andy Hampson's day. You're going to go on to try and get onto the top three in Paris? Yeah, you know, I really wanted to get some time today. It was a good group, and I was thinking more of the GC than the stage. But uh, the best thing for GC was to go as fast as I could up the hill. I, I, I believe me, I didn't want to quit today. I mean, uh, I quit mainly because I was 30 minutes down. Another three minutes, I would have been out of the time delay. Uh, I had hoped to, I honestly thought I'd be able to stay with Ed Gruppetto and finish within the time delay. Uh, I was dropped within one kilometer of the start. And uh, it's, it has nothing to do with my cardiovascular system. It has nothing to do with my mind. It's just, just when your legs are tired and dead, there's 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 nothing I can do. No more. Uh, I can't push my body beyond what it can do. So I just have to rest. But as one American goes down, another one comes up, and Andy Hampson was the man on top of Alf Duez first by a minute and 17 seconds ahead of Vona. Overall, Injurain's lead now over Kia Pucci, a minute 42. Hampson up to third. So three tough days in the Alps now behind the riders, 198 kilometres left on this 15 stage from Bourg d'Oison along to Saint Etienne. And this is Bourg d'Oison this morning and Andy Hampson, well, even Handley wouldn't have become the first American to win a Alpe d'Huez ride in this machine. The race soon underway and this breakaway going from the gun this morning, 20 riders breaking away. The lead at the moment just around about four and a half minutes and the gain, the speed extraordinarily high because over 50 kilometres have been covered in this first hour as they race through the Payage de Vizille. And this is one of the nasty little climbs. The riders today saying it was flat but you know there are three small climbs on the hill, the Côte de Georges Gat, the Côte de Barge and the Côte de la Croix de Chauberet. This is the Côte de Georges Gat, nasty little climb. And the rider just getting away from them all here, Richard Veron, nibbling away at the King of the Mountain points. And the riders here having to struggle on this small climb, the Côte de Georges Gat. The reason being it's very, very steep but it's not very long and they're totally overgeared for the climb. They're queuing up at the back here and now they're running into one another. And the rider on the ground there looks like a TVM rider. Well, that could be Rob Harmling. And, you know, Harmling really has had a strange tour. A win at Bordeaux, and quite a bad crash he had on the road into Brussels, and now he's fallen off again. This isn't so serious, though. 
Well, this is a little by road, and the organisation bringing the tour up off the by road over this short climb. Very little used by traffic. And then the riders return back down to the main road. It's really caught one or two riders out, including the great climber there, Fernando Cuvedo, sitting at the back of the field. And walking up the hill, Jesus Montoya on the left of our picture as well. They can't get up. Just look at the struggle that Harmeling is having on that bottom gear of his. There's Montoya. And the rider over to the right here. And it looks like he's going places. Cavedo has gone down again. Well, these are the two leaders. They are originally from that breakaway of 20, which has largely been swept up now. Fabio Rossioli and Harold Meyer in the lead on the PDM team. And the main field here, although they're showing a little bit of action now, they're still over four minutes behind those two out front. They don't threaten the overall lead, of course, of Miguel Ingerain, but they've gone for the stage win. And that's down in St Etienne today. Always a difficult road in St Etienne because it's very hilly just before you come down into the Bicycle City, which was once the main manufacturing centre of bicycles and the home of the former Mercia bicycles, which used to be rode uh, by the great man himself, Raymond Poulidor, six times second in the Tour de France. And the riders now onto the climb of the Col de la Croix de Chauberet, second category climb, Coccioli having a go. Coccioli trying to get across the gap. The gap is down to one minute. Coccioli, we haven't seen too much of him all tour. He's tried desperately to win a stage in the Alps and he's failed every time. And now he's just going past the rider there from TVM. And that was Dmitry Konishev that's been passed. This is Ronan Pensek, another rider we haven't seen too much for. This is the chase down now as we get down towards uh, St Etienne. It's a long, long drop and the drops are always dangerous. You can see now the rain has started to fall here. Ronan Pensek trying to catch it. Oh, and he's gone. Pensek has gone, and that wheel has gone under our camera on the motorbike here. Well, the motorcyclist did well to stay upright there, but the escape by Pensek has gone, and that leaves out in front now Franco Chioccioli. And this is a win which we expected to come a lot earlier than this, but he's going to get it now. Franco Chioccioli is something like 30 seconds ahead of the rest of the riders. So Franco Chioccioli, his first Tour de France, and at last he gets his stage win, he's promised, all through the race. And so Coccioli wins, but the yellow jersey stays firmly on the shoulders of Miguel Indurain, conserving all of his lead. There's the stayed result. Konishev 42 seconds back. Perini having a great tour in third place. Jalabert was fourth. Kirpucci, though, a minute 42 seconds behind Indurain. Hampston is third. And so the race goes on. St Etienne to La Boboule, 212 kilometres today, the 16th stage of the event. And after the Battle of the Alps now, just 133 riders surviving from the 216 that left San Sebastian. Here's Alan Piper. Things seem to be quietening down a little bit. The guys aren't so nervous today. Well, they weren't at the start. But we seem to be rolling to Paris. I think everybody knows today's the last dangerous day. And after that, straight to the Champs-Élysées. Party Sunday night at the Mexican restaurant. I'll be dancing on the table with Cody Jeff. <laughs> He's going to bring his vodka. <laughs> well, Alan, thanks for the sandwich as well, and we'll see you on the Champs Elysees. Well, the rain has started again now. Oh, and dear me, that's Hedges Montoya has gone down, and the other rider who almost went with him did well to stay upright there. As the riders come into the town of La Bourboule, and this is Tilly Marie, who's trying to keep himself at the front of the frame with the Castorama team, but the Onsei riders have got themselves at the head of the race, and there's trouble here at the back. And this, I think, is Laurent Fignon who's punctured. And Laurent Fignon struggling a little bit here to get his bike put right, but doesn't seem to be too concerned about the speed of the change. And Fignon, who rides on the Italian Bianchi bicycles these days, now back in the action as well. A bad time to puncture, though, and he's going to have a bit of a chase to get back into it. Stephen Roach further up the climb. I wonder if he knows that the weather forecast at the top is atrocious. There's uh, dense fog waiting for Roach at the top of this climb as he heads up the lower slopes of La Bourboule. But he's trying desperately to get something out of this Tour de France. He's threatened so much over the few weeks we've had at this race already. This is Eric Broeking, one of the favoured outsiders of this year's Tour de France. He hasn't really featured, but he's coming strong as the days tick down now of this year's Tour. And still that man is there, Claudio Chiapucci. If anybody goes on the attack, Chiapucci seems to take it as a personal offence against himself and always counters the move. 
Not surprising though, injury not far behind now, making sure Kierpucci gains no time at all. And perhaps now Roach will be allowed the opportunity to move a little bit further ahead on this long climb towards the summit of La Bobo, because Kierpucci has been brought back by Miguel Indurain. There's Jean-Francois Bernard just going through our picture, the teammate of Indurain and Kierpucci forced now to follow the wheels of the Bernesto squad. Well, I suppose if you spend the best part of $20 million a year on a big team, you should pick up the best riders, and it is a marvellous team, Benesto. They have a man for every day, and when they haven't got a man for every day, well, Indurain can usually handle what's going on. Neil Stevens doing a great climb here. It's great tempo. Now look at these conditions. We're waiting at the finishing line. All our cameras have gone down on the lower slopes because visibility has gone down to virtually nil. Roach is still away and should come through that murk. We don't know how far he is ahead, but he's not very far. But Stephen Roach has gone back to the greatness of his years in 1987 when he won the Tour de France. He's threatened to do something big throughout this tour. He's doing it now. The former winner of the Tour of Italy, the former world champion in 1987. He won in conditions very similar to this on the Obisque almost 10 years ago in the Pyrenees. And now Stephen Roach is coming to the top of another mountain, La Bobo. The first time the Tour de France has ever been here. What a shame we couldn't have followed him all the way up the climb. These last 250 metres, though, will be all for Stephen. As he comes up towards the climb, the best part of a minute still protected of his lead on the climb. And out of the murk, there he is, Stephen Roach, the professional to the end, puts his hat on and wins the day. I couldn't believe the, 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 the times I was getting, like I kept going up and up and up, so especially on the further hill, I had 30 seconds, and going up, I was 40 seconds, you know. No, no. What's the move? And the congratulations there from Bernard Eno, five times winner. Was the idea pre-planned, or were we just trying to open up the road for Kiapucci? Well, Kiapucci said he'd like to try and win today, if he could, you know, but... So, <laughs> I said, well, the only way he's going to be able to win is if I can attack in the final. But when the final meant the last hill, so then I decided that, well, I'll try... It's not, not point letting a group going away if I could try and go with it, so... When I saw Kiapucci and Simon going away on the second on the last hill there, I tried going with them, and when I caught them, I went past them, and nobody got my wheel. So I got to say, it was very long, very far to the finish, but on the other hand, at least if I'm on my own, not, not be beaten the sprint. And so the return to the Carrera team this year for Stephen Roach has worked wonders for him, finishing ahead of Vyacheslav Yakimov. Overall, though, still no change. Injuana ahead of Kiapucci and Andy Hampston. 17th stage, 189 kilometres away from La Bobule and on to mont -Luzon. And this arrived with only four fourth category climbs on it. A chance for a toe there from Stephen Roach off the yellow jersey of Miguel Indurain. And the tour now down to 131 riders. Just for the record, the last rider, Fernando Quevedo, almost four hours behind the race leader, Miguel Indurain. Early attacking riding again, this time Jean-Claude Colotti out in front and joined at the front by Franz Masson, the Dutchman, and those three riders on the attack. The other rider up there was the Panasonic rider, Marc Sergeant. Coming through the feed here, the breakaway has built the sort of lead that's looking good. Strong attack there. And look at this, Jean-Claude Colotti is gone. Now, there's a great rivalry exists between Panasonic and the Buckler team, and, you know, neither of those riders prefer to lead the other one up to Jean-Claude Colotti. Well, the Bonestos keeping the tempo at the front for Miguel Indurain. None of those riders in the front really concerning them. And they're not interested either. And the rivalry has left the other two way behind. And Jean-Claude Collotti has been given here one of the easiest wins of this year's Tour de France. And he knows it. Some consolation for Greg Lamont's Z team and a victory for the sprinter. A rider who's ridden well in Paris-Roubaix, but this is going to be his proudest moment. He'll remember this one forever. Jean-Claude Colotti cannot believe his luck here. He's profited from the rivalry of the two top Dutch teams, and they are not going to be happy with that. Look at that. Masson is second, Sergeant is third, and they allowed Colotti to escape. Overall, no change at all. And this is the 18th stage, 212 kilometres, and by the end of the day, the rides will have covered more than 2,000 miles. Jesper Skibby here, looking a little bit like Hiawatha. The ride is in good mood because this is a flat stage and there shouldn't be any problems for Miguel Indurain. He's thinking now of the second to last day's time trial between Blois and Nanter as the next challenge to him. Is this a sign of truce from Claudio Chiapucci? You know, I doubt it very much, and so does Miguel Indurain. He doesn't think so either. 
And the race continue at high speed, a little spin here, but now what's the matter with Alan Piper? I'm angry. <laughs> I've attacked about five times and all these guys are asking me what I'm doing it for. I said to Fondrias, I've been a whole week just getting inside the time limit while you guys race up these mountains and now I want to attack and you think we should ride slowly. Whackers. They got Ludwig in their team and Masu's just up there and Van Poppel's up there so we'll have a nice little bunch sprint at the end. But I don't think it's going to happen, man. So I'm going to attack at least a hundred more times. Alan Piper in great form, but there were times during this Tour de France when he seriously thought he wasn't going to see the end of his last big trip, La Grande Boucle. Well, the strong tailwinds are keeping this race more or less together today and making it very difficult. This is Phil Anderson trying to break away and perhaps Franz Massen behind him trying to make amends for the way he threw that stage away the other day with Marc Sergent and gave it to Jean-Claude Colotti. The field continually regrouping here. They're just trying to get off the front towards the finish. And I'm surprised that they do it now. Alan Piper may be wrong, actually. He didn't think it would be a bunch sprint. There's a small group still hanging on out there. But the constant attacking from the main field. There's a lot of riders still feel they have a stage win in them. Whether they can do it or not, well, time will tell. Stephen Roach again trying to steal a few seconds and again launching an attack. He's being joined by Maurizio Fondriest in the Panasonic colours. He said a good move. The wind coming slightly off the left shoulder of Roach at the moment. And Claudio Chiaputti, well, that could be trouble because Indurain surely now will be forced to chase. The time gap between the two still rests at 1 minute 42 seconds. <laughs> and this is Piper now having a go. Piper trying to break clear of the peloton. They're right behind them. And Piper going clear now. Well, he's as good as his word. He's going to keep on attacking until they get fed up and hopefully the elastic will snap. But the field, as you can see it, the sprint here are right behind him. There's no more time bonuses, by the way, on the sprints this year in the tour. So the big boys aren't taking part in them anymore. And the field gradually coming back together. A small bunch now, isn't it? 130 riders left in the race from those 216 that set out from San Sebastian. Still the riders no longer with any thoughts of a high overall position in this year's Tour de France, trying to slip away for victory. And slip away they can. It's Alberto Eli who's gone clear now for the Ari Austria team, and I think it was Fries on with him, but they've been swept up as well. And on the approach to Tours, it's a long, long straight here. This is Thierry Marie of France, surprisingly at the front. Yellow Knight, I'm tracking him. He's got a good chance of winning. Acacio da Silva on the far right. He opens up the sprint now. Nidam's got him. Marie goes with them. Acacio da Silva, the yellow jersey in Luxembourg a couple of years ago, as he leads to the wine now. Nidam trying to come on his shoulder. Marie in the slipstream, and the sprinters are coming. Johan Museo, Olaf Ludwig, Laurence Jalabert, they're all there pushing now all the way, but Marie is going to get this. Thierry Marie on the line, and that is a big surprise. Marie winning ahead of Nidam, Museo is third, and Olaf Ludwig finishing fourth. Overall, no change at all. Hampston holds on to third place. So, the race now facing up to its second big time trial, 64 kilometres between Tour and Blois. And today should be the day that we will see Miguel Indurain confirm himself as the winner of the 1992 Tour de France. The rider down the ramp there, Stephen Hodge. But this is another Stephen, Stephen Roach now, as he approaches the finishing line in the time trial at Blois. On the time for Roach, 1 hour 60 minutes and 32 seconds. It's not going to be the best time today, though. And Claudio Chiaputiu managed to spring an early surprise in the final time trial last year when he led at the first check. Well, he too now is under the shadow of Miguel Indurain, who is on an absolute flyer. Claudio Chiaputiu, though, about to win the King of the Mountains for the second year in succession and to maintain a high overall finish in Paris. That's his aim. Bunyo, though, has followed in the wheel tracks of Indurain as well. He's going through with the second best time at the Czechs and riding a much better time trial behind Miguel Indurain as he did in the first time trial when he was an absolute disaster. But Indurain is in his element once again. You give this man a bike, you put him out on his own, and he certainly is the best time trialist in the world right now. Kierpucci coming up to the finish, and Kierpucci's time will only be a top six finish for him today. And he's conceding almost three minutes to Miguel Indurain at the checks. As he finishes, and Indurain now almost catching Kierpucci here. 
who was second to last to start in Jane's time, the best ride of the day, one hour, 13 minutes, 21 seconds. Bunyo faring much better, losing only 40 seconds to Injurain. He finished in second place and stays in third place overall behind Keir Pucci. So the same three names now that finished in the top three positions in the Tour de France one year ago have got the top three positions overall for this stage, taking the riders now on to Nanterre. And it's 222 kilometres. And the riders, not surprising now, feeling in a little bit more relaxed mood. And that's the reason why Michel Dernis here is taking on a competitor from a different sport. Look at this. Come on, Michel. Come on, Michel. Half a length up. Well done. Victory to Michel Dernis. Well, there's still two more stage victories when he might get a stage win in this year's Tour de France yet. Again, the attack's coming on these long, flat roads as we head now up towards the finish at Nanterre today, and then we'll be on the outskirts of Paris, and tomorrow it's La Défense and on to the Champs-Élysées. The Tour de France still running at record speed, and the race now very much under the control of the Bonesto boys as this small escape has survived the day. Nobody of importance here, but Peter de Klerk will think it's important, trying to get another stage win for Lotto. Jan Nevin scored the first in Koblenz, and Peter de Klerk now holding off Van Zella from the GBM team, and Thierry Laurent is the rider coming up there as well. Laurent on the left, Van Zella on the right, but de Klerk takes the stage, and none of those riders in that leading group, some seven minutes back to the main field, containing Miguel Ingerain. They didn't affect the overall positions at all. Kia Pucci stays second, Bunyo third, Hampston fourth after that time trial, and that, for him, is a little bit disappointing. So, to the final stage of the Tour de France, 141 kilometres. The race starting from here, La Défense. You can drive to the finishing line in approximately 10 minutes by car, but the way the riders are going, it's going to take them quite a few hours. 141 kilometres and 130 riders lining up for the last stage of this year's Tour de France. The riders coming round to the Valley of the Chevreurs, no attacks of note all day. And now we're on to the Champs-Élysées, and the attacks have started. Vyacheslav Yekimov, former world champion of the amateurs, and now, of course, the defending world champion very shortly, if he rides in the world championships of the pursuit over 5,000 metres. Let's see just how fast he is here, because this is a tremendous race for the line. The field are boring down on him. He's got a real good chance, though. He winds it up. He won a stage like this last year when he went in the last couple of kilometres. He keeps looking over his shoulder. That's an elementary mistake. When you're out in front, you don't look where the rest are, because there isn't much you can do about them. You just go as fast as you can across the Place de la Concorde here now. Over the cobblestones, he'll flick right very shortly. Then he'll see the finish, that looks good. It looks really good for Yatislav Yekimov. He could be picking off one of the most coveted stages in any Tour de France to win on the Champs-Élysées. Something that the American John Pierce once found when he rode for 7-11. That was a great moment for him. Now it could be for the former Soviet here as Vyacheslav Yekimov lines up for the finish and the field line up behind him. And the sprinters on the far right, that is Johan Museo, still looking for the stage and coming very, very quickly indeed. And to the far, far right too he goes, and Museo now eating up, and look at this, Ludwig has come through, Olaf Ludwig, the teammate of Yekimov has gone over the top of Yekimov, Ludwig gets it on the line, and Van Poppel robbed into second place. Johan Museo was third, Jalabert was fourth, all of the top sprinters, but the winner of the Tour de France, Miguel Ingerain, receives the generous congratulations. He was the strongest rider in this race, and there isn't a man in it who will tell you that he was not. Tremendous applause from the crowd on the Champs-Élysées. The winner of the Tour of Italy now becomes the first Spanish rider to do the double in the same year. The French have a champion too this year in Laurent Jalabert. And one day you know he could win the Tour de France. He's a terrific all-rounder. He comes out the winner on points. He won over Johan Museo. It was a good battle between Museo and Jalabert, but in the end, Jalabert rather went into a clear victory. Claudio Chiapucci, the polka dot jersey for the second year in succession for him. And what a great cyclist he is. He entertains the crowd from start to finish. His greatest memory undoubtedly, and ours as well, on the road to Sestria. He wins the King of the Mountains, and justly so. Look at that point score ahead of Richard Veronc of France and Franco Chioccioli of Italy in third. The man who gets the biggest line of the lot on the Champs-Élysées and the biggest cheer too, Miguel Ingerain. He's now done the double for Spain. Can he finish it off? 
with a world title as well and joined Stephen Roach's Eddie Merckx as one of only three to do that. And so all that remains of this year's Tour de France is to see the parade of riders as they now take their lap of honour here on the Champs-Élysées. And believe me, every one of the finishes, all 130 of them, deserve that. This has been a tough Tour de France, even without the Pyrenees. One third of the field has dropped out. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our coverage on video of the 1992 Tour de France. Until the next time, when we meet again, this is Phil Liggett saying goodbye.